<laughs> you ever just get the feeling that when you step into a building, an area, or other place, that you aren't alone? Well, that's exactly the feeling I had when I entered the funeral home and morgue that my parents owned when I was younger. Of course, one would expect spiritual energy to reside within the walls of the old morgue, dating back to the early 1900s, a family business, and one of the oldest operating morgues here in the country for her personal reasons. I won't be disclosing the name of the morgue, but I have multiple stories of this place that will terrify you. They sure terrified me. The funeral home morgue is everything you would expect it to be when walking in. Barely illuminated, but light enough that you can see each room. Red concrete walls, red carpeting on the ground, curtains, etc. It almost feels as though you are stepping into a vampire's mansion. You have the lobby area and desk where clients are greeted for the first time. The fridge and freezer where all the bodies are stored. The viewing area where recently departed loved ones are awaiting family to visit. And just an overwhelming feeling of spirits and ghosts haunting the entire building. Oftentimes, I find myself alone working for my parents from the ages of 18 to 21. Little things here and there. Managing paperwork applications, etc. So, I'd often find myself there at night, some nights, completely alone. I'll never forget what night I was there. We had a new departed client arrive. The family that they had just set up the finances in order to cover the expenses of the upcoming funeral. And, we had to set up the viewing for those who wanted to see the man of the family, who unfortunately met his demise at such a young age, 43, working at a funeral home, you get some hysterical people who have a difficulty coping with the loss. Many choose to express themselves differently. Some are tight-lipped and reserved, while others tend to be conversational and talk. The widow of the man who passed away was very candid about her husband, spoke about how great a man he was, how he served in the Marines, how close he was with his parents. She was just very adamant about speaking about her husband and his career. So anyway, after she had left and the visitation for the family had ended, the husband was still set up in his casket. I went to the office area and closed the door, where just outside was the casket, or the viewing area was. So minding my own business, doing what I needed to do as far as paperwork is concerned. When I hear a loud knock on my door, I say what the heck was that? Since I knew I was the only one there, I thought it was a little bizarre. I thought maybe my mom or dad had stopped by to check in on me, since they are the only ones who would have come by. I then started to feel a pressure on my shoulder out of nowhere, as if someone's hand was being placed on me. It was getting a migraine and pressure on my head. This was all of a sudden. I was completely fine before then. So, anyway, I sort of ignored the knock at first because even though I knew I heard it, I thought I was just tired. So this time, I hear another knock at the door, and curiosity got the better of me. So I opened the office door and looked out. I see the casket from the distance, and the strange energy, as if a presence was there. I felt a burning desire to check to see the casket where the poor man was, so I go. I check the casket, and there is, just lying there, nothing, no surprise there. My back is to the office door, however, and when I finally turn around, I see a shadow for a brief moment's time, standing in the door frame. It ends up moving quickly to the right, and then just disappears. That's really got me. So I called up my parents, told them I'm going to close up, and leave. I believe that the shadow I saw was the man who was in the casket. Maybe he wanted to relay the message to the family that he was still around, and wouldn't leave. I guess that would be the explanation. 
So another story I have belongs to my dad who works at the funeral morgue. This time, he was the one who was finishing up paperwork for a new family that came in. And he was alone, late into the night. For some reason, he just keeps hearing whispering coming from the freezer and storage area where all the bodies of the people are kept. It would be on and off, as if there was a conversation of a few words exchanged between the two people. But it was very eerie, because again, the whispers would come and go, but he'd hear them. He wanted to make sure that nobody somehow was hiding in the freezer storage area. So he walks in, says, hello, anybody here? I kid you not. My dad said that someone or something answered back. He said he heard a loud yes that sounded so much like a human being. So he searched the entire building and couldn't find anyone else here. Remember, my dad was alone, wasn't expecting anybody, and yet this voice, heard clear as day, was there to greet my dad for a split second. Just pure insanity. When my dad told me this, I told him my story, because this happened shortly after my experience. Thankfully, my dad is a pretty open-minded person, so he didn't dismiss my experience, and neither did I with his. I remember having a strange dream about the funeral home morgue as well. What happened was, I was suddenly outside the morgue, but it was locked. When I finally was able to get to the door to the morgue, the morgue was lit up by candles all around, and there was a Ouija board surrounded by candles in a circle. I freak out, and I'm like, what is going on here? Suddenly, a screech that sounded like a banshee erupted from the building, and an old-looking witch gypsy appears and flies straight into the building and disappears. I wake up, sweating and absolutely traumatized. It wasn't a dream that made me feel good at all. I thought that maybe this place had some weird dark past that I was unaware of since the building was built in the early 1900s. So maybe there was a dark history of bad people there, way before my family took over the business. Perhaps it was an old home where people used to live. Before it became a funeral home morgue, we just aren't sure. Lastly, I remember going with my dad to ghost hunt and investigate, because I really wanted to uncover the secrets and mysteries of this place. What kind of dark entities, if there are at all, exist in this place, and if they did exist, would they be willing to provide us with clues and some answers as to what this place history was? So my dad and I did some EVP recordings in hopes that we could capture some ghosts speaking about themselves or the place they lived. The only EVP that was captured was a man's voice saying never bad after we asked it into the EVP if there were spirits there who were trying to do any harm. That really put us at ease. It made me think that every spirit that was there was not harmful and no demons. Maybe the dream I had was my mind overthinking, but who really knows? Thank you for allowing me to share my experiences. I used to often take little drives around town in the middle of the night to clear my mind. I was young had no clear direction in life, as I was genuinely confused about what I wanted to do with it. I feel like a lot of people go through these types of things in life, working a job that they don't necessarily hate just to get by, but not yet having a dream job to really appreciate, wishing for something a bit more, that kind of stuff. I was definitely not in the right headspace, but I digress. This story is about the time where I encountered something on the road late at night. To this day, I still can't put my finger on it, but it was very creepy and will stick with me for the rest of my life. So one night, I was aimlessly driving to clear my mind, sort of to get away from the pressures of life for a second, and decided to take a different route. I ended up lost in the middle of the night. Traveling alongside the road, I kept driving for hours on this strange gravel road in what seemed like the middle of nowhere for miles 
just a straight road that was going and going. The only source of light was coming from my headlights beaming forwards, until I ended up driving slowly past this old dilapidated church. It looked like it was abandoned. I then shine my headlights directly onto the church, and I see an old lady with a bewildered and stone-faced stare, just standing there. I mean, she looked very old, almost like she was near death. It was the oddest thing I'd ever seen in my life. The weirdest thing was, though, she even looked like a nun. I don't know if it was, however, because it was hard to tell 100%, but she was definitely wearing some sort of black dress or attire. She also looked very pale, even though it terrified me. I stopped and yelled from afar if she needed any help, just in case it may have been someone in distress. She didn't respond. I remember her starting to walk towards me, even though she was yards away, as she walked away from the church. I wasn't having any of that, and drove off. Still have no idea what that was, but it had to be a ghost of some sort. No old nun lady would just be standing in front of an old abandoned church in the middle of nowhere. Just doesn't make sense. During the day, I decide to go seek this old abandoned church out. So I go, and I find it. This time, there was no lady there. I was curious, so I step inside the church. Nothing. Nobody there at all. No signs of squatters. It was just an empty church. I don't even know why any homeless or squatter would end up here anyway, seeing as there is nothing for miles, and the church itself is literally collapsing. I had another one of these moments where I swear I saw an old dog running directly in front of my car in the middle of the night, then just to vanish into the night. I had no idea where it went, or how it appeared in the first place. It wasn't the same road as the nun lady, but it was in the same area I believe. Whatever is going on, I thoroughly believe that this road is haunted. This experience was in the morgue. I was getting a tour of the morgue. At the very end of the tour when the ghost tour guide was trying to contact a young man, I stood at the very edge of the freezer and my friend stood right next to me with her back to an empty hall that we all just came through. While the guide was trying to communicate, my friend whispered to me asking if he heard that. I turned to her and let her know that I only heard a child say something that I couldn't even make out. I then turned back around to listen to the guide. A few moments had only passed. My friend asked me again if I could hear that. I asked her what she had heard, and she said she stated she was hearing breathing in her ear right between us. I bent a little and tried to listen, but heard nothing, so I just shook my head and turned back around. She then told me to hold my breath so she could listen, and I did for about 20 seconds. After a few more moments had passed, she told me again, You don't hear that. This time, the look on her face was of horror, and her eyes were teary. I then shook my head, then turned back to listen to the guide. Suddenly, it felt as if someone took both their hands and slowly expanded their fingertips widely on the back of my head. I turned around, but nothing was there. Plus, my head was against a freezer, so no one could have done that. I have wrote to you before about my other experiences, but I've worn about a haunted house a friend of mine lived in a few years back. A bunch of us used to hang out there. He had a lot of bonfires over the summer. The first time I'd ever went there was a few months after he had moved in. I was dating his best friend, and he told me that he thought it was haunted. I in turn did not believe him. At first, then things happened. We were in the kitchen, and all of a sudden we heard something from the basement, like someone using a broomstick and hitting the ceiling from the basement. I laughed at first and asked who was down there. Then I saw the look on my friend's face. He was terrified. 
and suggested we go outdoors for a while. While we were outside, I asked what was going on. He said that was the ghost's way of letting him know he was annoyed. So he leaves the premises for a while. I still was skeptical until I looked up and could see into the front door. And standing there in his living room was this old guy who was somewhat glowing. I almost hightailed it out of there when they decided it was safe to go in. I told them I was leaving and they insisted I go back in. So I did. I asked my friend if he ever seen this ghost. He said no. I described to him what it looked like, and he looked into the previous owners of the house. Well, it turns out there was a guy who died in the house who looked like the same man I described. I freaked out after that as well as my friend. Things were going good at first, like every time my friend came home from work, he would announce himself, and the guy would never bother anyone. There was always this room upstairs that every time you walk by it, you could feel a cold draft from the door, and it was locked. We never thought anything of it, so the man started to get mad. There were more parties going on out there because of summer. Well, the man seemed to not like the parties, and he started showing himself more to me and my friend. I knew he was getting mad, and things got bad when he started attacking my friend at night. He would wake up with slashes across his back. We checked into the history more and found out that the man was not friendly when he was alive and worse when he was dead. It did not take long for my friend to move. The beatings were worse by the time he left. Although he never attacked me, I always felt threatened by him. I would wake up to him right in my face and he would disappear when I would scream. I still think about the horrors that the man would do to everyone and how my friend survived actually being attacked by a ghost. Sometimes I still have dreams about this man and how he chases people out of his house. To this day, the house is still empty. In the late 1970s, I attended a college in New York State around the Finger Lakes. The building I described was built in the 1890s. Since we were in the middle of the first oil crisis, students who remained on campus spent the short winter term in the old main dorm to conserve energy. As it happened, some friends and I were assigned a large empty room on the top floor. It was four floors up and one floor below the attic and one end slanted along the roof line. The room had primarily been used for storage. The gloomy winter sun had a hard time shining through the one iced up window facing the lake. Dark as it was, we cheerfully shoveled the desk one side and slept on the floor to give us more room. We were having a good time camping out and weren't inclined to do much schoolwork until our papers were due. After three weeks or so, a winter storm was approaching, so we set to stock up on necessities and have a little party just amongst ourselves. I'd like to say that we were all sober as judges and went to bed early after saying our prayers. However, it being the late 70s, we indulged in smoke and alcohol. We had the music stereo up loud, but the music couldn't completely cover the growing sound of the wind. Our window was frosted up and had a tree branch scratched at the glass. Every now and then, Someone wondered whether we would be snowed in. Someone said we would at least be able to get down on the tree. Eventually, we turned in, unsurprisingly. That night, I had a very spooky dream. A woman hovered over me and was trying to say something to me. God knows I tried to understand her, but her fluid outlines and vivid colors made me feel a little bit queasy. I woke up, certain she was still in the room. I saw nothing, just the shadow of the tree limb swaying outside. Too much party, I thought, and went back to sleep. We were quiet the next morning. I supposed it was due to too much of a good thing the night before. The snowdrifts were impressive, as the wind had been so wicked. The sun was out, and the sky was clear, and the snow was pristine. 
It was so different than the storm that I felt up to sharing my spooky dream. It seems that two of the others had a strange dream as well. Since we all dreamed different things, I was certain nothing occult had happened. I was very relieved since we still had three weeks to live in that room. Being a Florida girl, I was still curious about snow still and wanted to have a look around. I dragged a willing soul with me and we make a quick trek around the yard. Finally, I wanted to see about our tree. My companion was crying about the cold as she ran into my back. When she saw why I had stopped, she said, son of a crap. You may have guessed by now, that there was no branch, no tree, no vegetation within 15 yards of our window, and nothing was four stories high. We dug in the snow a bit to see whether it had fallen. Nope, no trunk, no hidden limbs in the snow. We ran up to the room to look out and make certain we had the right window. When we heated off the frost with a hairdryer and we looked down and saw nothing but our tracks. Every one of us marched back down to try and find our tree. Nothing. We went back upstairs and talked a bit to get over our shock. We're all skittish. I managed to sleep in the room with our mattresses shoved much closer together. After that, we never mentioned much. Why bother? There was no rational explanation. I'm just glad I wasn't the only witness. That would have been crazy making. Hi. I live in the United Kingdom and have had a few ghostly experiences. My first one I was about seven or eight, just after I had my dog passed away. He used to sit with me at the top of the stairs when I was younger, as if to protect me from falling down. He would let me be me till I made it all the way up or down. After he was gone, I used to sit on the same top stair, pining for my best friend. One evening, I watched as a cat walked from the dining room door which was open through the living room door, which was shut. This wasn't the only time I met the cat. I always slept with the door shut to my bedroom, but felt a cat paw and pat its way to getting comfortable on my bed. I also remember it purring as well. We did have a cat at the time, so I thought it was her. I reached down to stroke what I thought was my cat. Instead, there was a small indent in my mattress when I turned the light on, there was nothing there. My door was still shut, and my cat wasn't in the room. During my teens a few times, I woke up to find my light on and television turned on. This stopped when I moved out of the family home when I went to college. I suppose more disturbingly is what has been happening to me for the last few years. In three different properties I have lived in, my bed was shaken. First couple of times it happened, I was really scared, but I've gotten used to it now and have accepted it. If I had the courage, I would ask it what it wants, but it has never hurt me, and I believe it is there just to let me know it's looking out for me. Whenever it has happened, it is usually when I have been upset. It happened after I broke up with my ex-girlfriend, for example. Thank you for listening. From what I've seen of your website so far, it has been brilliant. I'm really not a big believer in ghost stories. I usually believe that there's a reasonable explanation for just about any paranormal encounter. But there is one story that my brother-in-law tells that I think there may be more than just a ghost story. He and some friends were driving home from visiting a nearby town's hockey tournament or carnival, I don't recall which, and they saw an old man walking in the middle of the road in front of them. My brother-in-law honked his horn to get the old man to move, but he paid no attention and just continued to walk on the road. They continued towards the old man and continued to honk the horn, but he just went about his business and ignored them. My brother-in-law says that as he approached, almost close enough to strike him with the car. The old man seemed to rise up 
and glide right over the roof of his car. Needless to say, they were all pretty freaked out. They thought they might have struck him or something. They still weren't prepared to admit that it might have been something more than just a man walking, so they stopped and got out to search the roadside to see if they indeed struck him. But they searched all around the area and found nothing to indicate that anyone else had been there. They still get creeped out by the story when they tell it to this day, because they all swear that they saw the old man, and I know these people. They are the last people that would make up a half-cocked ghost story. At my church when I was the age to be in the choir, my choir director was very religious, so of course, she believed in demons. She used to live in this old house that was built in the early 1900s. As the usual setting for a ghost story, it was a dark and stormy night. She was a single mom at the time and lived in the woods. Her kids were very young, so during the storm they got scared and came to sleep in bed with her. When they fell asleep, she went to the bathroom. While she was in the bathroom, she kept hearing strange noises. She rushed herself so she could get back to the bed with her kids. When she was going to her room, she walked past her broom closet. When she did, the air got cold and she felt a presence. That's when she looked into the closet as she went back to see what was going on in there. And she saw a face staring at her from the closet. She slammed the closet door, ran back to her room, and fell asleep. When she awoke the next morning, she had a huge slash on her back. It was more like scratches, but it looked deep and scary. Well, that's the story I have. I hope you enjoyed it. About two years ago, my family had our first experience with our ghost. When one night, my older brother got up to go to the bathroom. While he was there, he heard a screeching noise from behind the shower curtain. It got louder and faster as it continued, and he ran out of the bathroom and into my room with his trousers around his ankles. He called for me to come into the bathroom. Drowsily, I got up and we started down the hallway. We never did enter the bathroom because we were both much too freaked out when a shampoo bottle came hurling out of the bathroom door, hitting the wall opposite it and rolling down the hallway. I slept in his room that night. After that, we had many encounters with the ghost that we began to call Christine after the famous Stephen King novel. Though I personally never witnessed her, both of my parents and my friend did. My mom was the first. One night, my friend Midge and I were asleep on the living room floor when the alarm on Midge's cell phone went off at about 3 a.m. It didn't wake up Midge or I, but my mom got up and came out into the living room to turn it off. She saw who she thought was me standing in the hallway on the other side of the room. She ignored me to retrieve the phone and silence it. That's when she noticed I was asleep on the floor besides Mitch. Scared, she went back to bed. Later that night, Mitch woke me up crying and insisted that I just shaken her awake, then ran into the kitchen. When she looked over, I was asleep next to her. Several weeks later, my dad was pulling into the driveway late one night and thought he saw me sitting on the couch, pulling back the blinds and staring out the window. As he pulled close to the house, I put the curtains back and got off the couch. But when he came into the house, he discovered that I wasn't even home. I was spending the night with a friend. In between these experiences, eerie things occurred around our house. The silverware dresser would fly open and slam shut. Doors would open, close, 
and walk by themselves. Lights would turn on and off. Then, a very strange event occurred when I made a collage on my wall of pictures of my friends. I had about 200 or so pictures completely covering one of my walls, which took me a very long time to do. I went to bed and awoke the next morning to find that every last picture containing Midge had been taken off the wall and was in a pile across the room with all the other pictures. And that is the end of my story. I lived part-time, if that makes sense with my dad in Whitmore Lake, Michigan, before he passed away last year. One night, it was about 2 a.m., my dad was out somewhere, and my brother and sister were asleep in the other room. I was sitting at the computer, talking to my friends. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw something peeking around the corner of the room I was in, right at me. Usually this happens a lot to me, and then when I look at it, it disappears. Frightened, I turned slowly to look at it, and it stayed there, just staring at me. I wanted to puke. It was extremely tall, maybe seven or eight feet tall, and had long bony fingers and long, sharp nails. It had long gray hair, and its face wasn't that of a person's, but looked decayed like a monster. I got very scared. And after about three or four minutes, which it seemed longer, it slowly backed away from the wall. I told the person I was talking to on the computer what was happening, but for some reason, I was too scared to get up to call my dad. I ran upstairs, and when I turned the corner to go up the stairs, I saw it again, standing at the top of the steps. I'm a huge scaredy cat. So I was freaking out, and I had tears in my eyes. I ran up the steps with my eyes closed and ran into my room. I turned on my light and checked in the closet and under my bed. Then I slammed my door and locked and laid in my bed until I fell asleep. The next day I woke up and went downstairs and saw my dad in the kitchen. I told him about the previous night. And before I could even describe what the creature looked like, he already knew. He told me that he saw it all the time. He told me just to ignore it. My dad was definitely not a religious person, so it bothered me that he was okay with the crazy thing just staring at me. Or anybody. To this day, that was the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. I don't like to tell too many people because they just look at me like I'm crazy. And now I wonder if the thing had any connection to my dad and his death. About a year later, he got me heavily into drugs and was going downhill. And even after he lost his huge house in the lake that he spent his time and money and energy building, he still wouldn't leave the home. He lived in between the home and his neighbor's house in his camper. In July of 2004, my dad intentionally decided to leave the world. It makes me want to go back and investigate. That's my story, anyway. I grew up in an old house in the rural area of Sandy Lake in Stonesboro. It was built around 1847. On the bottom floor, the walls were 16 inch stone. The top floor was built during the time the brick builders traveled through Mercer Company. Our kitchen was on the top floor, and outside the door was this large lilac bush. We milked cows, but I didn't care for milk. But each night after dinner, I had to sit until I drank my milk, and my parents went into the living room. It was a nice night. I remember the door was wide open and I saw an old woman come up the walk. She had her hands wrapped in her apron. 
I turn my head to yell at my mom to tell her we're getting company. And when I turn back, the lady walked around the bush. When my mom got there, I told her about the lady and she got very pale and called my dad. And I had to tell him the story. And being six, I didn't understand their looks. Dad went on to prove to me that there was nothing there, but I saw her. As I grew, she stayed and often just stood there outside my closet door. Even as a teen, she caught me from falling out of bed one night. I never enjoyed her being there, but tolerated her presence. Dad later told me it was probably my grandmother who lived down the road and passed before my birth and she always folded her hands in her apron when not busy as idle hands were the devil's plaything. The house is still there and I wonder if grandma's there too. I would like to share a story about my friendly and sometimes not so friendly ghost mother-in-law. I moved in with my boyfriend now my husband, shortly after I left my last husband in Colorado. He had a son who lived in the basement of the home he inherited from his mother. My boyfriend lived upstairs, and he and his son had established a rather bachelor existence, coming and going with no notice, dishes everywhere, etc. My arrival was not met with joy and friendship from his son, because I brought structure and responsibility into the home, as well as rules. Family was very important to my then boyfriend. His son tried to emulate him as much as possible. My mother-in-law made herself known to me right away that she did not like the disagreements and bad feelings in the home by removing items from the kitchen and around the home, some that have never resurfaced. I spent a great deal of time in the home alone, so I think I was aware of it the most. Plus, I was the only one who did dishes. Anyway, time went on and things disappeared, only to reappear in the weirdest places. Wooden spoons, which were obviously favorites due to their worn condition, disappeared and reappeared and disappeared completely never to return. My husband, who was one of the most difficult to convince of supernatural occurrences, I mean, he saw his mother in a blinding white light standing in our hallway. He said I was sound asleep right next to him. She then faded to nothing. The last occurrence was when I was thinking really bad and evil thoughts about a co-worker of mine while doing the dishes. The dishes were many and stacked all over the counter. I was concentrating on what I was doing in the sink, washing dishes, when all of a sudden, a landslide occurred, sending several sharp knives flying, as well as a cobalt glass globe, daylight holder my girlfriend had just given me, crashing to the floor. I was thrilled to see it hadn't been broken, except for one large piece that could have been glued back. As I was crouching, looking at the glass globe without picking it up, bad and evil thoughts all ran rushing through my mind. I watched the antique knife sharpening steel literally hopped off its nail and crashed to the floor, flipping several of the items already on the floor, smashing hard into the cobalt tea light holder, crushing it to smithereens. Since the nail had a large head, and the circular hook on the end of the steel was somewhat ornate. You had to lift it off the nail, over the head to lift it off the nail. I never doubted again the thoughts or things, and my mother-in-law, who hadn't put an appearance in in years, thought I should be aware of that, telling me to stop sending bad thoughts into the atmosphere. She always seems to appear during times of stress, not exactly a comforting spirit, but one telling you to buck up and get over it.
I was staying at a friend's house a couple of years ago, and she did warn us that it was haunted. Of course, I didn't believe her, but after seeing this, I do now. Unfortunately, there is no evidence or photos, but I swear that I've seen a ghost. Anyway, there were the three of us sleeping in my friend's bed. They were asleep. I was not. I looked to my left at a blank space in the wall, right above my head, and to my absolute shock, a hand began to move through the wall. I thought it was just my imagination, and woke my friends, and just pointed at the hand coming out of the wall. We jumped out of the bed, and ran to the opposite side of the room, and waited. The hand began moving out of the wall, and attached to the hand was the body of a woman. Now, it wasn't what I imagined a ghost would look like, all floaty and transparent. It just looked like a woman standing there. She was about 5'2", which was about my height, and she was dressed in black jeans and a button-up white shirt. She was barefoot, long brown hair. She stood there for what seemed like ages. It was only about two minutes, but that's all she did. She just stood there. And then she turned, and she walked back through the wall. To this day, I will never forget what she looked like. Unfortunately, as I've said, there was no evidence that would make you believe me. No one else does either, but I swear that I've seen a ghost. I happened to stumble upon your sight, and I found it very fascinating. I thought I would share something that happened with my family with you. We live in the UK, in a small town called Stanley, in Co Durham. My mom, my little sister Rebecca, who was a week away from her fifth birthday, and I were going into the town center when Rebecca stopped at the top of the hill, and then she turned around. She pointed to the golf course that you would see from the top of the hill looked at my mom and said, That's where I crashed my plane when I was a man, mommy. She then began to stress that she saw a figure standing right there, just waving at her and smiling. Rebecca then waved back, and we asked her what she was waving for. She proceeded to tell us that her friend Billy was waving back. We didn't see anything and shrugged it off. We both laughed it off and said, come on, don't be silly. But she went on to tell us that she was flying with her friend Billy when they lost control and crashed and that they both died and how she thought it was nice she could still remember Billy. When we searched it just out of curiosity, it turned out that a BE-2C had actually crashed there in October of 1960, killing both of its pilots who are both members of the Royal Flying Corps. Unfortunately, no names were listed, so we could not see if Billy was there. How else would a girl who is not yet five and could not read well enough to research some things like this know that this was the place a plane crashed and killed the pilots years earlier? I recently returned from a visit to my boyfriend in the beautiful state of Pennsylvania. On one of our day trips, he took me to Pithole, a large oil boom town with a lifespan of 500 days. Since it was fall and late afternoon, we were afraid the visitor center wouldn't be open, but we were jovially greeted by three members of the staff who told us we were just in time for the movie. Entering the small theater, we joined a couple and their two giggling girls. Twenty minutes later, my boyfriend and I started down the hill to what was once a pit hole in the meadow. You'll find descripting markers of the buildings and the streets, a few old wells, and holes in the ground, which were once cellars. We were reading the markers and snapping pictures. When I saw my boyfriend stop in his tracks, 
and shake his head. I asked him if he was okay, and he said he was, so he continued walking. I kept hearing a conversation between a man and a woman, and assumed it was the couple with the girls, so I kept looking up the hill to spot them. We got to the end of the street, and we're talking about French Kate, a brothel manager, when it got really cold. I could still hear the man and woman talking, but my teeth were actually chattering, and I was having trouble breathing. I grabbed my boyfriend's hand and started up the hill, thinking we might be having an experience, but not wanting to say anything. He asked me if I was okay. I told him I was, but it was so cold down there, I was having trouble breathing. As we walked up the hall, the temperature rose and I was breathing easier. Once we got home, we talked about what we both experienced. My brother stopped in his tracks because he saw the back of a woman in a dress walking behind a tree. We both heard the conversation and felt a drastic temperature drop. I was the only one who felt breathless, but I guess we all have different reactions to experiences. I kick myself now for not taking any pictures, but I guess I was trying to rationalize everything. My name is Brittany, and I live in Greenfield, Massachusetts. I always thought I was crazy when I was little. Now I know I'm far from it. Okay, so I was about five or six at the time. I live in an old, big, whitish, grayish house on Woolly Greenfield. I had two imaginary friends when I lived there. Hatta and Heidi, a little boy and an old lady. I used to always play with them, and my mom was a little confused at the time. Like, is it normal for a little girl to have an old lady as an imaginary friend? But they were my best friends. I used to go in my basement with them and see things, like a man in a suit, standing and reading a book. I would run upstairs and tell my mom, but she would never let me go look. So we moved about five years later into a house on Greenfield. This house was worse than the last one. I was about 11 or 12 when we moved, and I live in this house still. And I walked into my room four or five weeks after we moved in, and I saw two little girls. They were in pink and white trilly dresses, rolling a blue ball back and forth in the middle of my room. I screamed and ran out of my house. I called my mom at work and told her the story, and she said it's okay. They won't hurt you. I've seen them too. I was absolutely shocked that she said that, but I went back about six hours later, not to find anything at all. My phone rang two times before the answering machine picked up, and the smell of cigars filled my house. When I listened to the phone, there was two little girls talking on the other line. So I picked up the phone and said, Hello, who is this? And they hung up. So after six months of me and my mom getting hit on the back, or tripped, or lights clicking on and off, we decided to go to the library to get some kind of history on our house, and the old house as well. We found out that the house that I lived in when I was five or six was an old funeral home, and my imaginary friends were far from imaginary. The house we live in now is an old boarding house, and the little girls have no records of ever living in the home. They don't bother us anymore, but you can still feel them every once in a while. Once, when I was around five years old, we were visiting my grandfather. He lived in a small town near the northeast corner of Colorado. My grandfather's house was very old. The only indoor plumbing that it had was a kitchen sink, but even that was somewhat antiquated. The water would come out of the faucet, but it had to drain into a little pot that sat on the floor underneath it, 
which then had to be tossed out of the door. To go to the bathroom, we had to go to the outhouse in the backyard, which in itself was rather scary. The house was surrounded by trees, and I seem to remember that there were railroad tracks nearby. One night, during the particular visit while everyone was in bed, my brother in the front room on the couch, my grandpa in his room, and my mom, dad, and me in the second bedroom, a strange occurrence was about to happen. It was pitch dark, and I was lying in the middle of my mom and dad, which made me feel very safe and secure. I was wide awake and happened to be looking in the bedroom door. That's when I noticed that someone was walking through it. My mom and dad were both still in bed, and this did not look like my brother or my grandpa. It looked like a very small woman wearing a veil with her head slightly bowed. Anyway, she, or whatever it was, walked past the brass footboard of the bed, went to the window, turned around, walked past the foot of the bed again, and then out of the door. The image was extremely bright in the otherwise dark room, and I did not feel frightened by it at all. Now, the next story scared the living daylights out of me. I was around 10 years old, at home, in a very unassuming bi-level brick house. My grandfather's house looked the part for a haunting, but this one, not even close. It was just your average everyday home. However, something not so average was about to take place in it. It was in the middle of the night, and for some reason, I woke up. From where my bed was, I could look straight out into the living room, which I just happened to be doing. And that's when I noticed the dark image walking out of the kitchen. It walked into the stairs and stood there for a few seconds. I concluded that this was my dad, about to go downstairs to check on my brother, who was a teenager at the time, to make sure he had come after being out with his friends. But he seemed to change his mind about doing this as he turned and started walking towards my room, which was nothing out of the ordinary, because he had to walk past my bedroom to get to his and my mom's room, he stopped at my door and stood there looking at me. I finally said, hi, dad. I got no response. I looked at this dark image more closely and noticed that it was staring at me with big, dark, hollow eyes. No, this was not my dad. And in spite of the fact it was not threatening me in any way, I lost it and started screaming. This screeching woke my mom, who rushed into my room, running right through the dark figure, and it vanished. I slept on the floor in my mom and dad's room for about a week after that. I would like to tell you of an experience my husband and I had when we were living in an old house in the village of Alamnitz, North Carolina. We lived in this house for two years and discovered we had another child in our house other than our two children. You could sit on the couch in our living room and out of the corner of your eye see the shadow of a small child, female, maybe three years old. I know this was not my own children because my daughter would be in school and my son was an infant. I never said anything to my husband until he saw it and told him I had seen it several times, but didn't say anything to keep from being accused of being crazy. That spring, I was reworking my flower garden in front of the home, and as I cleared away the grass to extend my borders, I found a brick edging in the ground about the size of a small child's grave. I've never been able to find out any history on this land. We have since moved from the house, but I've always wondered who this little child was and why she is still at this home. We never felt uneasy in this home.
My mother was very young when she had me, so when I was growing up, my grandmother would help me out a lot. I was very close to her, having been her first grandchild. I know she loved me very much. When I was 17, my grandmother developed heart problems and had to have surgery. She was in the hospital for a long time, never really getting any better. Then one cold night, my mom was going to the hospital to see her. I really wanted to go, but I was very sick with a high fever, so I didn't think it was a good idea for me to visit her. I went to bed around 12.10 a.m. I remember the time because I looked at the digital clock next to my bed. On March 10th, 1991, I was awakened out of sound sleep by the feeling of someone squeezing me so hard, I almost couldn't breathe. That lasted for about three minutes, and then I felt a feeling of extreme sadness. I brushed it off, as I must have been hallucinating, due to the 104 fever, and fell back to sleep. About 40 minutes later, my mom returned from the hospital and woke me up to tell me my grandmother had passed away. I sat up in my bed and asked when, and my mom told me around 10 after 12. I cried, and then I told my mom what happened. I had such a close relationship with my grandmother. I really felt she wanted to say goodbye to me and hug me one last time before she left this world. This is a shorter story but one that will always stick with me. When I was a little girl, I would often have nightmares and afterwards would run across the hallway to my parents' room to sleep with them. One night, after a terrible dream, I went to the room only to find the door locked. I banged on the door crying that I was scared. My dad then said, come on in, the door is unlocked. I tried and I tried, but the doorknob wouldn't turn. While waiting for my dad to unlock the door, I glanced down the hallway into the living room. I saw the figure of a man getting up out of the rocking chair and coming towards me. Just as I screamed, my dad opened the door. I ran and jumped into the bed, telling my parents what happened. I've been around ghosts my entire life, for as long as I can remember. My house has had several unexplainable things happen. Doors open and close on their own when no windows are open. Lights will flicker and blow out only in certain parts of the home. We have used the same lamps in other parts of the home, the same type of bulb from the same box with no problems. When I was a child growing up with my older brother, we shared a room together. We were always told to clean our rooms before supper, and we always did. Every night when we went to bed, our rooms were nearly spotless, but every morning, when we woke up, our rooms would be a mess. When my parents asked me about it, I told them I was a ninja, big Ninja Turtles fan, and they asked what I was talking about. I told him it was a man dressed in black, and he was messing everything up. After my older brother moved out, we switched rooms since ours was bigger. In the room I have now, arguing can be heard from the restroom, which was never repaired when we got the home. The arguing goes on for about three or four minutes, getting louder and softer at times, which always ends with a muffled shout and scream. After about 15 minutes afterwards, you can hear sobbing. My younger brothers hear it too, but my parents remain skeptics. They don't want to scare them. Now they mention the imps. My friends and I have heard about the Jewish graveyard on Santa Ridge Road in Ferguson Valley, Lewistown, Pennsylvania, which is only a few miles away from where we live. We've had so many experiences there, 
but since this email is already long enough, I just want to let you know I've had experiences with this stuff throughout my life. I'll get to the point now. The graveyard started out with nothing there, but as we went there more and more, we saw more. I haven't gone back there the last time we were there. My friend Jen was in three different places at once. We spotted creatures just as you described, being around the apparition that appeared in your home. There's more to the story, but I don't want to waste your time explaining all of this. If you heard about the graveyard before, the last time we were there is the last time I'll go there at night. My girlfriend and I drove past it two weeks ago, about two months since the last time we were there, and we saw a young boy dressed in early 1900s style clothes with a brown shirt, a brown vest, and a brown hat. I've been over there over a dozen times and never have I seen anything outside of the gates. It was the belief of my friends and I that they could not leave the gates, as they never had before. But the child was crouched down on the edge of the ridge outside, as if waiting for us. This was nearly two in the morning, and it was raining, but the child did not appear wet, and I'd say that they appeared around eight or nine years old. My husband and I lived at the house for one year and had several experiences. Our apartment covered two floors, the third and the fourth. The living area, kitchen, etc. was on the third floor, bathroom and second bedrooms on the fourth floor. It started slowly, like after I had gone to bed. My husband would think that I was awake because he had heard someone walking out of the bedroom. The TV and clock radio would turn on and off by itself, sometimes change stations. The bathroom door would sometimes open by itself. One time, after getting out of the shower, there was a three-dimensional image in the mirror of a man in a sports coat. You can't see a face, but you can make out the shoulders, the lapel, and even that one button is buttoned. We happen to take a picture of it, actually. It's hard to make out because it's a mirror, but you can see that it isn't something we can draw in the mirror ourselves. One time I felt what I thought was my husband sneaking into bed, as to not disturb me. I felt the weight of his body behind me, and the weight of his arm over my waist, just holding me. My heart was racing like I'd never felt before. I reached my leg back to touch him, and everything vanished instantly. Another time, my husband was getting ready to come upstairs to bed, and thought that I was trying to scare him by the stairs, so he slowly crept up the stairs. When he got to the top, he saw a large black shadow hovering at the top of the stairs, then it vanished in front of him. He saw that shadow again at the foot of our bed. When I told my daughter, who was out of state at college, she said we all knew something was there. It's about time that we saw it. The next time that she came home, she saw it out of the corner of her eye. When we moved out of the apartment, we had two last trips to the truck, and we went to get the last box. The door was locked. We didn't lock it. So I have a story about ghostly lights. The lights I'm going to try to explain have more to do with me, I believe, than a particular place. About 17 years ago in Texas, I came home from work, and as always, Danny, my Pomeranian, was jumping and yapping, happy to see me. He followed me into my bedroom where I sat on the edge of the bed removing my shoes. On the floor appeared three tiny white lights in the form of a triangle, moving slowly in front of me. Danny saw them and sniffed them. His ears packed, and he ran out of my room. 
I watched these lights move for about 20 seconds, and then they were gone. I ruled out every possible source I can think of. The blinds were always kept closed in my room. It spooks me still. There was an instance where my daughters and I watched lights move in the corner ceiling of the living room. I ran to get the camera, but the pictures came back. Nothing appeared on the numerous prints. We all saw the lights, and about four weeks ago, it happened again, only this time, I'm in Minnesota. I was sitting in my room on the bed, watching TV, when I had this urge to open my door, like I felt something was on the other side. I opened the door, my eyes focused on the floor, because I expected one of the cats to be there. A light on the floor, about the size of a teacup, moved slowly into the room. Again, the blinds are always closed in my room. A few days later, my 13-year-old fell asleep in a recliner and woke to hear voices whispering incoherently behind the chair. She said she picked up a book and threw it into the air and told whatever it was to please shut up. But the whispering continued until she went into her bed. I never said a word about the light I saw either. It all disturbed me so much. I had to find a medicine man and ask him to please advise. Often, I can smell freshly brewed coffee or something delicious cooking, but visual occurrences are extremely rare for me. I do believe in ghosts. Black Forest, Colorado. It isn't just a lay residence. I just wanted to say that I am enjoying your website. I was personally a visitor of the Lee residence when he wanted me to clean his house. My sister-in-law went with me. I was halfway up the stairs. She was at the bottom, and we both got extremely warm for a period of three to five seconds. Well, we couldn't get out fast enough. This home is also known for faces appearing in the mirrors locking people in the rooms and ghosts standing over you. Very creepy. Most of Black Forest is haunted. A little known fact is, the Native Americans, long before the white man arrived, said it was evil. They had a pathway of bent trees marked through the Black Forest. It was the fastest trail to cross through. It always has been eerie. The property I grew up on is behind the Black Forest store. Nobody has ever been able to walk down the driveway from the store to the house at night without feeling as if someone were about to eat you alive. It is horrifying, and as soon as you get to the light at the house, it goes away. Orbs are in every picture we have taken there. I have several pictures with ghosts in them. They have been seen, heard, felt, and even smelled there. And you'll hear stories like these from any long-term resident. And the new people wonder what's wrong with the place. My family alone could keep you busy with stories for a week about Black Forest near Colorado Springs, Colorado. I grew up in suburban Illinois. I have had a great many experiences throughout my life, currently 24. As a child, 5 through 10, I've had many experiences seeing floating faces and heads in my parents' home. One night, I woke up around 1 a.m. Whenever I wake up in the middle of the night, I would walk over to my parents' bedroom to get back to sleep. I felt safer there. Our bedrooms were all on the second floor. As I walked up to their bedroom, I noticed a white object over the staircase, floating at about my height. I wasn't sure what I was seeing, so I walked down the staircase to see what it was. I looked up at it and saw nothing but a floating white cloud. At this point, that was when I realized I could go through it, and nothing was holding it up. 
I ran screaming to my parents' room. Another time, I was sleeping over in my cousin's house, about age 12. I was always the last to fall asleep, and I hated it since I was always scared of the dark. An hour or so after everyone else fell asleep, two cousins, one brother, an aunt and uncle in another room. I heard the back door, along with the screen door, open and close. I heard several people walk into the home talking wildly. Although I couldn't make out what they were saying, they all walked into the room we were sleeping in and continued to talk and otherwise make lots of noise. I hid under the blankets until the noise stopped. I never slept over there, ever again. My name is Karen, and I live in a small town on the coast of North Carolina. I've always been sensitive to paranormal occurrences. It began when I was small, and my imaginary friend was actually my mother's cousin, who had died nearly 12 or more years earlier. I told her his name, what he looked like, how he died, everything. That was just the beginning. Then, when I was about 13, we moved into the home my grandfather grew up in. My house is between 80 and 90 years old. My grandfather and his 13 brothers and sisters grew up there. My great-grandfather actually died in what is now our living room. My sisters and I have experienced many creepy things. Take me. I've actually seen my great-grandfather standing over me. I was sleeping on the couch in the living room, in the exact place where he died, and suddenly I woke up saying something odd, and as my eyes began to adjust to the light in the room, I saw the apparition of my great-grandfather. He looked exactly like he did in the picture of him we have hanging in our entranceway. He actually looked multicolored, like when the TV scrambles and you see all sorts of colors. When I was fully awake, he disappeared. Needless to say, I was absolutely terrified, but I actually stood there trying to rationalize what had just happened after everything occurred. I also didn't like to be alone in my house that night, especially if I have to go upstairs. It's not that I feel unsafe, but I always feel like someone is directly behind me, breathing on my neck. My sister lived with us with her son for a year, while her husband was away at boot camp. Her son was maybe between one or two, and we constantly heard soft humming coming from his room. When we put him to bed, he would sit in the hallway, staring at the wall laughing and babbling to someone he called Big Mama. We asked my grandfather about it, and he said they used to call his mother Big Mama. No one had ever told any of us that, and we definitely didn't tell my nephew about it. While they lived with us, my sister was really screwed around with. She went to the kitchen late one night to get a drink, and when she opened the freezer to get some ice, she heard the sound of what she described as a woman's high heels, like they were in the 40s, bigger, clunky heels, and the footsteps stopped at the edge of the kitchen door and then directly behind my sister. She heard in a whispered voice, shh. She ran out of the kitchen, leaving the fridge open, and jumped on the couch where my mom was sleeping. She also was always awakened to a woman's voice softly calling out her name. One night she had gotten fed up with being woken up and she sat up in bed and said, Great Grandma, please let me sleep. Just let me go to sleep. From that night on, she never heard her name being called again. It's not only the family that gets messed with, it's our friends too. Once, my sister had a boyfriend that stayed the night and slept on the couch where my Uncle Ty had always slept before he passed away. Lee, the boyfriend, kept on having his feet thrown off the couch. 
being in the middle of sleep, he didn't really regard it as anything, until he finally woke up to his feet being held up in the air and his legs being twisted back and forth. My college roommate recently came home with me and slept in one of the rooms upstairs. It used to be my room, but that room never even got warm, even in the summer when the upstairs of our old house is blistering hot. It remains cool. Anyway, she woke up in the middle of the night to see a man lying on the floor with his hands behind his head. He never moved, but he just stared at her. When he disappeared, she got up and turned on the lights and slept with them for the rest of the night. I could really go on and tell you even more stories, but I think I've written enough. I hope you enjoy my stories, and believe me, these are true. I wouldn't have spent so much time typing them out if they were fake. I love the fact that our house is haunted. I feel privileged. And it seems that every time one of my grandfather's brothers or sisters passes away, our house receives more activity. They are all just coming back home, I guess. Pretty short story, but I think it's worth mentioning. Our family moved to this old house about five years ago. It is located in Ray, Michigan. A small town, of course. The house itself had some very scary and bizarre occurrences. Pictures fell off walls. Objects and small items were constantly moved around. And we somehow managed to get ourselves locked out of the house for about 45 minutes. The odd thing about that moment was we had never locked the doors previously. And even if we did, we had the keys. My family and I were trying to open the door with the keys, but somehow the keys wouldn't even work right. So eventually, we were able to get into the house via an open window. Other things also happened, such as money would mysteriously just vanish and then go missing. It would then appear in another place shortly afterwards. Pretty bizarre. Of course, all these instances forced us to have a priest complex to home. We also came out to find out some disturbing details about ghosts who live here. One of them is a woman who seems to be living in a crawl space under the mudroom, as well as the rest of the basement. The mudroom and basement are combined. What was intriguing was the door. The door of the crawl space kept falling off. But after the priest blessed it, the door stayed on. I can't really put my finger on it. We have also seen another figure in the home. Have seen her face actually. She's a young girl, dressed from the 1950s, hair like the 50s. This house was built in 1928, but I'm not too sure about what was here before or who did even live here in the past. I know that this house used to be a part of a farm. Don't know any of the history around here either. I know this sounds crazy, and at first, I was a little nervous about all the creepy things going on in here. But this young girl doesn't seem to be doing anything real harmful. She's more prone to being a prankster and playing tricks. The other woman in the mudroom, I can't say for sure. I try to stay as far away as I can. That's the story. Ancient Hawaii had a feudal system of government. Each island had one chief Ali. Each village had lesser Ali. Each island also had a city of refuge where the soldiers of the Ali couldn't enter. Laws were harsh at this time. One could be clubbed to death by merely stepping on the shadow of the Ali or eating one of the many forbidden foods. To escape the king's wrath, the criminals would flee to the city of refuge. The city of refuge on Oahu is now Lai. Three ancient temple markets extend. These are the only temples on Oahu where human sacrifice wasn't performed. 
After a sufficiently long stay in the city of refuge, criminals would try to sneak out. The Ali had a special troop of soldiers who patrolled the outer limits of the city of refuge, ready to carry out punishment. Today, the spirits of these soldiers still patrol the ancient boundaries of the city of refuge, two in front beat drums, followed by four pipers. A thousand warriors march behind, looking for anyone trying to sneak in or out of the village. This ghost story became real to me on a camping trip at Hokkaido Beach. As is the custom, we used tarps to create a roof and wind block. We didn't bother with regular tents. Our shelters open up to Hokkaido River and the beach. We told all sorts of wild tales and stayed up until a little past midnight, then turned in. About two o'clock, I was woken up by the sounds of distant drums. My tent mate also was awake. We looked around, but couldn't see anything. The drums were louder now, and the sound of the flute floated through the air. Scared, we ran back to our sleeping bags. More noises played on our ears, marching feet. As we gazed out towards the river, we saw a long column of mist advancing. It hugged the river down to the beach, then turned right. The sounds grew stronger as the mist got closer. After the mist passed, all was quiet again. That morning, we found thousands of footprints following the same path the mist traversed during the night. Never again will I camp so close to the boundaries of the city of refuge. My father passed away in April of 2002, and his loss has been very difficult on both myself and my mother. Mom had a dream right after Dad died, in which he came to her, sat on the bed, and just smiled at her. She felt he was okay. I never had that, and so I wanted to know he was okay. The oddest thing has been happening. My mother and I were preparing to go out one afternoon. Mom looked down saw a penny on the floor and picked it up. She smiled at me and said you realize that when you find a penny, someone from heaven is sending you their love. She held up the penny and said I love you to Richard, my father's name. I simply just smiled at the thought and off we went. I didn't think any more about it. Well, since that day, almost every day, I find a penny on the ground in various locations home, work, on the street, you name it. They are always heads up. The first few times I didn't pay attention, I would pick them up and go on. Then it struck me that it was happening an awful lot. Maybe my mother is right and daddy is sending me love. So now each time I see yet another penny, I smile and say, I love you too daddy. I hope you keep sending me pennies from heaven. One night after band practice at my high school, I went to the band room to get my bag. We were practicing outside. As I went to get my bag, there was a faded image of a girl playing the flute. I walked towards her. As I was walking, I stopped about 10 feet away from her and said, come on, it's time to go. She said okay and walked away. As she was walking away, her legs weren't moving as she walked. I thought my head was thinking weird things, so I just let it go. And as I was getting my bag, I turned around and I heard a running sound coming towards me. I threw my bag, about 13 chairs, and one instrument. The running stopped. I looked for my bag in the pile of chairs and saw that the girl's flute was there. I said to myself, I didn't throw a flute. I threw a trumpet. That's when I started to scream because I knew it was that girl's flute. I ran to my car outside. As I was driving away, I took a quick look in the band room window. She was right there playing the flute, looking at me. That's when I found out that the girl was a Japanese girl. She died in the band room when the band teacher beat her after school when everyone left. 
This strange encounter happened sometime at the end of 1983. We, meaning the ex-husband, four-year-old daughter, and my son, who wasn't a year old yet, and me, the mother, were stationed in Barber's Point, Hawaii. I was getting ready to make a trip back to Ohio. I never really liked sleeping in the dark, but my husband at the time liked the darkness. I remember waking up like I was being smothered by this big black thing. A big giant spider is what I thought it to be. Whatever it was, I touched it when I was frantically swiping it away and screaming. I jumped up, switched on the overhead light, and followed what looked like a black steam cloud from a tea kettle. It went into the kid's room. It went straight to the baby's crib and hovered there. By this time, I was frantic, screaming, and yelling for it to leave. It quickly raised up from the crib and exited out the window. By this time, everyone was awake, and I related the story to my husband at the time. He thought I was crazy. A few days later, my daughter, new baby son, and I flew to Ohio to show him off to the family. And that's where my story ends. Thank you for reading. My daughter came for a one night visit with some of her coworkers and she spent the night with me while the others went to a hotel. The next morning she dropped me off at work and did the tourist thing with her friends and they were scheduled to leave that night, April 21st. I got home from work around 5 p.m. and did my usual routine. I walked into the bathroom to turn on the small oscillating fan on the counter and I noticed a battery pack sitting in front of the fan. I looked at it and wasn't sure what it was, then walked into the living area to open windows, etc. Around 6 p.m., I called my daughter on her cell phone to check on where they were. They were checking out the hotel and had to hurry to return the rental car. Then she asked, By the way, Mom, did you see my battery pack? So I told her it was on the counter in the bathroom. She sighed, and I told her I would mail it to her the next morning. After we hung up, I went to the bathroom to get the pack so I could put it in my bag, but there was no battery pack on the counter. I stood there, pretty stunned, and I knew I hadn't touched the pack or moved it. I looked everywhere and finally decided I would have to let her know something happened to it. The next day, April 22nd, I called her in Dallas and blurted out, I don't know what happened to the battery pack. I couldn't find it anywhere. She said, I found it, Mom. It was at the bottom of my carry-on bag. She said she must have put it in there early in the morning and forgot about it. I told her it couldn't be because I saw it and even described it to her. Well, this was a strange encounter. Now I'm wondering about the holographic universe and dimensions. Thanks for letting me share my experience. It's never a dull moment. First off, let me explain that I am in the military, and we were living in military housing at AMR during this encounter. I was married at the time. I don't recall the exact date, though I know it was early in 2000. My wife and I were home on a Saturday morning, relaxing like we usually did. I was entertaining myself, playing video games and sitting on the couch, while my wife was at the computer desk about four feet behind the couch, checking her email. All of a sudden, I felt what I thought was a hand pat me on my left shoulder, as if to say what's up. For a second, I thought I could feel someone standing behind me. Figuring it was my wife, since we were the only ones in the house, I turned to greet her, and there was no one there. And then I also noticed that my wife had not moved, and was still typing at the computer. My next thought was that it must have been our cat, China, playing around. So I asked my wife where the cat was. She turned her chair to face me a little, showing me that the cat was laying in her lap. Obviously, I was a little freaked out, so I told my wife what had just happened. She got scared and asked me not to talk about it. Soon after that, I was again on the couch, holding and petting the cat. 
Unexpectedly, she started to claw into me, while at the same time looking at something unseen that seemed to be right behind me. The experience gave me a chill. I let the cat go, and she ran off to the bedroom. Though I thought it was a bit weird, I shrugged it off, even though I was a bit unnerved. A few days later, I was laying on my bed watching TV, and I noticed that the cat had wandered in the room, so I called to her. Usually she came right to me right away, and she stood there, just looking at me. So I continued to call to her until once again, she seemed to see something behind me. At this moment, I sensed a presence again. The cat turned and ran out of the room. As you can probably imagine, I was a bit tired of it all, so having had enough, I turned my head, looked over my shoulder, and as a reaction said something like, please leave me alone. After that incident, nothing more ever happened. First off, let me explain that in Hawaii, you are raised to be suppositious from small kid time. I was always told that if you ever hear someone calling you from outdoors after dark, do not answer or you will be taken away by some spirit or obake as we call it. When I was about 11 years old and quite obsessed with supernatural powers, witchcraft, ghosts, and such, day after day, I would hold up in my room and read every ghost book I could get my hands on. In our backyard, we had two big mango trees which for some reason would scare the bejesus out of me. You could not get me to go back there in the dark even if my life depended on it. One night, while in my room reading, I kept hearing my dad call me from the backyard. Being an obedient child, I answered him. When he called me again, I got scared remembering what I was taught when I was younger. I went into my parents' room to check and see if my dad was outside, and if not, and to see if indeed it was him calling me. To my surprise, he was on his bed watching TV and asked me why I was yelling for him. I explained to him what happened, that I heard him calling for me from the backyard. He told me to never answer a call from outside unless I know for sure who it is I am answering and that he did not call for me. Needless to say, I was scared to death and did not want to go back there even during the day. All the neighborhood kids would want to go back there and climb the trees, pick mangoes, or play hide and seek, but day after day, I would refuse. Like all kids though, I eventually forgot that night and went to play with my friends in the backyard. We must have been playing back there all day. I didn't realize until around sundown that it was getting late. I remember the night someone called me from the backyard. The mango trees make good shade during the day, but at night, they make it even more dark. As I was walking very quickly around to the front of the house, I heard my baby brother calling me, sounding really scared. For fear of getting in trouble, I am the oldest with two younger brothers. I ran back to go get him. When I got to the corner of our house where I could see the backyard, something made me look up in the mango tree. To my horror, I saw a pair of glowing red eyes. I ran into the house as fast as I could. I just opened the front door and saw my brother there at the kitchen table waiting for my mom to bring him his plate. After telling the story of my encounter in the backyard, my mom tried to convince me I suffer from an overactive imagination. I am positive what I saw was not of this dimension and most certainly was a supernatural being. It's what we in Hawaii call chicken skin. My family and I were out for a night drive and decided to head to Kiwanala Beach in Yokohama Bay, Makakawa. It is a drive we took many times to watch the sunsets or to gaze at the stars. On this night, we really didn't notice how dark the night seemed. As we entered the park, it seemed as though we were the only ones there. My sister needed to use the bathroom, which is located near the entrance of the park. When we stopped, we noticed three lights at the end of the park, about a quarter mile away. 
Most locals tend to park there to avoid police patrols, who most times won't go that far into the park. We assume that some locals attracted the attention of some officers. As we were getting back into the car, we noticed that these lights, way at the end of the park, changed from blue to green. Soon these lights started towards us. As these lights would bounce up and down, the number of lights would multiply by hundreds at a time. Each light was only about 3 inches long and 4 to 5 feet off of the ground. This covered the whole beach from the mountain to ocean which is about 2 to 3 football fields wide. All of the lights move up and down at the same time, each by multiplying by the hundreds. It soon gained on us near the entrance in a matter of 30 seconds. We all got back into the car and quickly left. These lights were about 40 feet away from our car but we couldn't make out what it was. As we left the park, we passed another car. We were so frightened that we drove as fast as we could to the nearest convenience store and stopped to talk about what we had just seen. As we did this, the car who passed us before heading to the park drove right past us at a high rate of speed. It was later that I found out that it was the Hawaki Po, or Night Marchers. Thanks for reading. Today I have a story for you that is very scary for me, but might be a bit sad. Also, this is fairly recent in memory. I'd say it was about a month ago now. I was chilling at my grandparents' house, which is quite large. I hated, and still do, going up the stairs alone when nobody else is in the house. Alright, so now I'm getting to the point. So me and my brother Tasman had stayed over the night. But during the night, it seemed that I would get woken up constantly to the sound of someone digging their heel into their wooden floor and then dragging it as if they were limping. This was very creepy as neither my grandparents nor Tasman own a pair of hard shoes. Then I thought back to my great grandmother. She had a broken leg and since she was so old, she died because of it. She always wore those wooden type shoes, so ones that look like clogs, but have a buckle and a heel. Then I have one more strange event that happened to me and my friend Katie. When we were about 12, we were about to watch a small movie. Nobody else was upstairs, and this is really important information. When we heard a little human sigh, it sounded like it was from an old lady as well. We sprinted out of there without even thinking but it gets even weirder. Me and Katie both sat down to watch that same video again when out of nowhere the whole room just went white. Like a blinding white but just for a split second though. There wasn't any cars around and it was most certainly not the sun. So how? From now on I'm not going upstairs by myself or with a friend to watch movies and I haven't stayed the night since. This was all very strange and I hope that it will not happen anymore if I go back to my normal ways. Thanks for reading. The following story involves a house that is literally across the street from my best friend David. By the way, David's house is haunted. You can hear the story in Hell Freezer's channel. This story takes place in my city and neighborhood of Silver Spring, Maryland. Anyway, one day, David and I were building a patio for his backyard. I decided to take a break and head it out front. I sat on his rocking bench and lit my cigarette. That's when I noticed a disturbance coming from that house. As I stood up to take a closer look, I noticed an old Korean woman muttering hysterically in her foreign language while waving around something that was smoking. While she paced back and forth, she was trying to be comforted by two family members. I was immediately intrigued by whatever she was holding but also wanted to see if I could help. I slowly approached the situation. As I got closer, I see the woman with tears in her eyes holding what is mostly known as the sage smudge stick. A sage smudge stick has many purposes, and one is cleansing a space inhabited by evil spirits. I asked the other woman, her daughter, what was going on? She told me that this was her mother's home and that she couldn't stand the ghost in her house anymore. My mom thinks this place is haunted by an evil spirit. I asked if I can help with anything, but she declines. I wanted to keep asking questions, 
But this wasn't any of my business. David's neighbor knew a lot about our neighborhood, told me why the house was haunted too. He said that in 1989, a young man who lived there killed his parents and then himself. I found an old article on this story. It stated that a 27-year-old man, armed with a shotgun and a rifle, fatally shot his parents in their bed in their Wheaton home before killing himself. Back to me. His parents didn't live in that house, but he did. His sister was the one to find her dead brother. The police officer asked her whether her brother was mentally disturbed. She nodded yes. I suppose a troubled man can also be a troubled ghost. When I was 17 years old, a group of friends and I decided to check out a haunted place in our state of Maryland. It is known as Crybaby Bridge. As a side note, in the early 70s, my mom actually went to this same exact bridge when she was 17 too. It's pretty cool stuff to be honest. Now, this bridge is also known as the famous Goatman Bridge. There claims to be a Goatman Bridge all over the country, but through some research, I discovered that this particular bridge was the original, at least for the legend of Crybaby. If you're ever in Maryland, go to Governor's Bridge Road in Bowie. There are some sketchy backwoods characters who live out there, so be very careful. Anyway, let me start this story from the beginning. There were five of us. Andy, Hector, Mary, Jessica, and of course myself. We hit the road all excited. Andy was blasting his new subwoofers he installed in his Cadillac, so we were in good spirits. Our GPS was directing us pretty well in the beginning, but once we hit that area of Bowie, it literally stopped and our phones were all disconnected. Jessica was filled with fear and grabbed my shoulder tight. I assured her and Mary, who was also scared that this is how it is in the boonies. We were getting so close to the bridge, but didn't know which dirt road to take. It started getting dark. That's when we randomly came upon a trailer park spot. It wasn't really a trailer park community, but just three isolated shacks that were literally miles and miles away from civilization. I mean, fuck. You see that kind of shit in the movies and know that this would be a good time to leave. But we were so close to the bridge that we couldn't just turn around. Hector decided that we should ask for directions. When they saw our car stop on this dirt road next to their home, this woman and man got up from their rocking bench and walked slowly over to our window. The woman, who was maybe in her 70s, she was missing her two front teeth and was holding a Budweiser. And the man, who was maybe in his 30s, was a husky fellow with the most cliche backwoods outfit on. He had it all down to a T, with the dirty overalls, missing teeth, confederate flag tattoo, shotgun by his side, and a lit marble Lucy hanging from his lip. They were very friendly, almost too friendly. They had already known why we're here. Apparently, a lot of people venture out to this bridge all the time. I asked if the rumors were true. The man with his slight southern twang said they used to hang goats from nooses back there. I asked about the crybaby bridge. He said he didn't believe in that one, but the woman did. She told me her version of its origin. Keep in mind that there are once again many variations of this legend's origin. The origin I was told was that legend states that in the early 20th century, a young woman was impregnated, but not married. In order to avoid judgment by family and peers, she drowned her baby in the river. Days later, with all of her guilt, she was trying to find her baby, which of course would have been impossible, so she too jumped off the bridge to her death. Time for the fun part. The urban legend rules were to first cut the car lights, get out, stand right in front of the bridge, and shout, I have your baby. What's supposed to happen is first you'll hear the faint sound of a baby crying. As soon as you head back to the car and get in, the woman will appear with a soft but crying voice, repeating, where is my baby? She then will erupt in anger and chase you down, only to disappear. So here we are. However, I did one thing a bit different, which I've now learned never to do again. Being the asshole that I was, instead of just saying I have your baby, I said, I have your baby you stupid bitch, come and get it. Yes, disrespectful. I know viewers will be mad but I thought it might achieve more attention from the ghost. I was also trying to be funny and show off to the girl I was seeing. I was a dumb 17-year-old kid, so give me a break. 
Anyway, nothing happened, although I did feel a bit strange, but I figured it was all in my head. Now this is where it gets creepy. When I got home, I went downstairs to my computer to do more research on the bridge. I've only been home a couple of minutes when I hear a loud crash from upstairs. I thought it was my grandpa who would occasionally drop something off his bed or even fall, so I rushed upstairs to his aid. I run down the hallway and reach my grandpa's room and he was sound asleep. I look around his floor and nothing was on the ground. I shrugged and turned back around. That's when I see it. I must have missed it while I was running. I stand there shook and see that three frame pictures off both sides of the hallway walls had fallen off the wall and shattered on the wooden floor. As I look at each picture, I notice that every single photo was of me as a baby. One was even my mom holding me as an infant. I put two and two together and thought, oh shit, did this ghost follow me home? I must have really pissed her off. I thought this had to be a coincidence. I pick one broken picture up and notice that my dog is acting strange. She was staring at the front door. It was so intense. I was calling her, offered treats and even tried to move her, but she wouldn't budge. This bugged me out because she always, and I mean always, loyally listened to me. I do believe animals can see things we can't, and my dog was aware of some sort of presence. I was starting to get really nervous, but kept my composure and remember my dad telling me a story about a ghost experience of his. I'll make it quick. My dad said when he bought his first apartment, it was extremely cheap, almost too cheap because the last two tenants claimed it was haunted and wanted out. Apparently, a woman was stabbed to death in the apartment eight months earlier, and now she's haunting it. My old man could give two shits about it. It was cheap, and he didn't believe in that stuff. His outlook changed the very first night he moved in. He said every night, around 11 p.m., he would hear what sounded like footsteps starting from his hallway and ending at his bed. He's a mechanical dude, so he thought it had to be time machinery within the walls. However, after a week, it clearly sounded like footsteps. So one night, when he heard that last step at the foot of his bed, he announces, Look, I'm sorry, but I live here now. I don't mind that you're here either, but please stop making noises because it's scaring me. And just like that, it stopped. So I decided to do the same. While holding the broken frame, I apologized out loud that I'm sorry for saying those things. I don't have your baby, and I won't ever do it again. My dog then clawed the door. I opened it and closed it. She was back to normal, and I didn't have a sense of dread anymore. After that experience, I did research and found that if ghosts are angry enough, they can attach themselves to you. Then again, this all could have been a coincidence. But what I learned is that you don't disrespect the paranormal. This is a story of a young woman that got killed on the highway in the town near us. Some people say a gang of men attacked and murdered her when she got stuck on the highway late at night. And some say she was killed by a moving vehicle on the same highway when she got struck there at night. A guy who said he'd encountered her late at night was basically driving home at night on the same highway the lady got killed on. While he drove, he noticed a young woman hitchhiking, so he decided to give her a ride. He picked her up and asked her where she wanted to go, and she said she wanted to go home. She got into the car and he noticed the temperature dropped, so the man offered the lady his jacket. When he got to the young lady's home, she wanted to give him his jacket back, but he refused, saying he would pick it up the next morning since it was still a bit chilly. The next morning, the man went back to the house of the young woman, and he found an elderly woman at the house, and so he asked if he could fetch his jacket from the young woman, whose name was Sheila, which he later discovered. But the elderly lady refused, and looked confused, and told him that Sheila had died years ago, and she used to live there. She told him where she was buried as she did not believe the old woman. He then got into the car and drove to the graveyard where Sheila was buried, and lo and behold, he found his jacket draped over the headstone of Sheila. One night, some friends and I were driving around, and we decided to check out an old bridge that was supposedly haunted. 
The story behind it is that a girl hung herself from the old one-lane bridge in the country. My best friend, Tommy, is into ghosts and believes heavily in them, and I decided to call him out. I was telling him that he was a coward and nothing would happen if we went there. As we turned down the foggy, beat-up one-lane road, I ridiculed him about the whole situation. As we came to the bridge, a black cat scurried across, and in my headlight, the green eyes of the cat glanced at us eerily. As we crossed the bridge, my friend told me that this was a bad sign. I again replied with sarcasm, and told him that must have been the ghost. We passed over the one-lane bridge so that we could turn around down the road and come back over the bridge facing the main road. My friend Tommy then convinced me to leave. We drove around a bit more, and I convinced him to go back with me. We went back, and like the first time, we crossed the bridge, turned around, and drove back towards the bridge. We then came to the bridge once again, and I decided to stop my vehicle on the bridge. I went to put the car into park, and glanced into my rear view mirror. When I did this, my jaw dropped. A fog-like figure shaped like a basketball head with a human body walked behind my car turned towards me and looked at me with the same green cat-like eyes. It looked upset and I've believed in ghosts since. The anger in the cat's eyes shot fear down every limb in my body. I then hit the gas and flew out of there. Now I am a 3 plus 0 student at the University of Finley in Finley, Ohio. I am a baseball player at the university and I am about 6'2 and 200 plus pounds. I am not scared easily and I get chills whenever I think of this. I can't even tell the story to friends without coming to fear, and the image is ingrained in my mind. I feel like I have upset something, and I now believe in demons and ghosts and would like to learn more. On January 8th, I was hanging out at a local shopping complex with a couple of friends of mine. My friend, Mary, turns to me and begins telling me a story of a bridge just over the North Carolina and South Carolina state line called Catswoman Bridge. She was telling me that a number of years ago, a woman was driving home one night and just before she was about to cross the bridge, a cat ran out in front of her. Trying to miss the animal, the woman swerved and wrecked her car in the woods just before the bridge. The next morning, local police found her car sitting, upside down, underneath the bridge, Upon investigation, police found the woman's body being beaten by a group of cats. My friend, Mary, continued to tell me that if you park your car in the center of the bridge and turn off the engine, you can hear the faint sounds of a vehicle crashing into trees at the end of the bridge. I'm in total disbelief. She continues to tell me that if I go to start my car to drive away, then my engine will not start unless it is pushed to the end of the bridge. I decide, okay. Let's test this. We drive to the bridge, and I park my car in the center of the bridge. As I go to turn off my engine, my other friend, Robin, starts crying with fear and begs for us to leave. Not wanting to upset a close friend any further, I put the car in drive and began to drive away. As I drive away, there was a very thick fog that completely obscures my vision momentarily, and I decide that it's time to go home. However, the only way to go back home is to drive back over the bridge again. I turn my car around and begin to make my way over the bridge. The moment my front tires are on the bridge, my engine dies. Now, this could have not been a mechanical failure due to the fact that I was driving a 2005 Chevy Impala. I apply my brakes to prevent wrecking my vehicle, but my brakes wouldn't work until we rolled over to the other side of the bridge. After we get to the other side, I stop my car put it in park, and restart my engine. Just as we are about to pull away, we all see bright lights that appear to be car headlights beaming upwards at an angle as if it were a car that had run off the side of the road. Scared out of my wits, I drove as fast as my car would get to get off that side of the road. When we got back to my house, we look over my car as soon as we get out. To our surprise, there were cat's paw prints all over my car the hood, roof, and trunk. There were also streaks that looked like someone had tried grabbing the car with their hands. There were also complete handprints on my back window. None of these prints were there prior to us going to the bridge. 
I sent my car through a car wash almost an hour or so before we went to the bridge. I tried doing a search on the bridge and I found nothing. At first I was skeptical about the validity of the bridge, but after this, I will never drive over that bridge again. Thanks for reading. I was in the Navy at the time and stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. I was driving to Houston, Texas on leave and had been on the road all night and alone. My diet had consisted of just coke and it was coming on 2 to 3 a.m. I remember seeing something out of the corner of my eye, so when I turned to look, I was surprised to see what appeared to be a runaway slave sitting in my passenger seat. He had an unkempt fro and bib overalls with no shirt. He kept looking around frantically as if someone was chasing him, then he was gone. I then noticed something out of my other eye. When I turned, I noticed hovering outside my car was an older white man with a sunburned face and neck, wearing a khaki shirt and sporting a crew cut. Out of the two apparitions, him I did not like. Now things started getting interesting as he proceeded to yell or chant something at me through the window as I was traveling about 70 miles an hour. The next thing I knew, I was transfixed on my windshield as it starts to turn white, like at the beginning of a movie when the screen goes white. Oblivious to everything, the slave man starts yelling at me to look out. I snap to and am literally inches from plowing into the car in front of me. Then everyone was gone. A few minutes later, the white man shows up again and everything starts over and ends the same way. Finally the third time it happens, I couldn't snap out of it as quickly. I felt the car shaking and bopping about as the white man chanted and the slave man yelled at me to look out. When I did snap out of it, I was in the median between the two roads headed for a bridge. Of course, there was no bridge for people on the median, so I slammed on my brakes, took the keys out of the ignition, covered my head with my jacket and prayed. I fell asleep for a couple of hours and when I woke up, I drove home without incident. That was trip one of two. I never really believed in the paranormal. I consider myself a skeptic and wholeheartedly believe that it is rational to question experiences without substantial evidence to back it up with. I do not believe in a higher power and consider myself to be an atheist, but after these accounts I had, I now believe that the afterlife does exist. Firstly, I wanted to reassure you all that I am not crazy. I'm not on any medication that causes me to hallucinate. I consider myself to be a competent human being. And during this experience, I was completely awake and alert. I was inexplicably looking out my bathroom window from upstairs. I say inexplicably because I can't even begin to explain why I felt the sudden urge to look outside my window. It was almost as if I felt some intense energy force me to look outside my window and I couldn't resist it. So I was brushing my teeth and that's when I noticed it. A cloaked figure, the size of a normal sized man, floating across my courtyard, wearing all black. I wasn't able to get a good look at the apparition's face because I had only noticed it from a side angle and it was 20 feet away, moving across my line of vision where I was able to get a side on view of the hooded figure. My initial reaction, believe it or not, was met with apathy. I did not think anything of it and so I went on with my daily routine. I think I may have been in denial about it because I just didn't want to convince myself that spirits exist. And besides, I had an important job interview that I had to get ready for. A few days later, I was sitting in the living room watching YouTube videos on my laptop. I decided it was time for bed, so I closed my laptop since it was getting pretty late. I can't remember exactly what time, and I was home alone, but still alert. I just couldn't sleep. I had completely forgot about the experience I had a few days prior. Now this is where it gets extremely creepy. As I was heading upstairs to go to my room, I swear on my life, I heard a distorted voice saying the words death and now whispered faintly in my ear. I can't even begin to explain the eeriness of it all. It just didn't sound human. 
and it had a certain calmness to it. Seven months later, my 27-year-old brother died in a horrendous accident involving a car hitting him on the M40 after he ran out of fuel and was walking down the hard shoulder to get to the nearest fuel station. Could this have been some sort of warning? I can't seem to find the answer I'm looking for on Google, so I've signed up on here in hope of finding some expert help. Again, I consider myself a logical human being, but after these experiences, it seems there's much more to this universe that I can't truly ever explain. This is one of the scariest experiences I've ever had, so I'm going to tell it to you right now. My friend and I were heading home from a friend of ours in a nearby town or village, I should say, because I live in a really remote location. It is at least 15 miles from my house, and there are a lot of alternative roads to use. The best roads are the longest, so we figured we could check the GPS to see if there was a quick route, and we saw an alternative road we decided to use, which to all of our surprise, we never heard of because both of us have a very good knowledge of this part of the county. We started the drive, and the first part, we're on a road we knew well, but as we seen on the GPS earlier, the left turn into the unknown was coming ahead. We took the left turn onto a gravel road with no signs on it, and it was heading right into the forest, and we drove for a few miles. Suddenly, asphalt appears in the middle of a timber truck-like road, and thick smog was building up outside. So I was fighting to see the road, and it was getting really cold in the car. We kept on driving longer into the woods, and then, out of nowhere, a lady all dressed in white was standing by the side of the road. She was holding an old washboard and looked me right into the eyes with what looked like black eyes or very dirty around the area around the eyes. I remember specifically her long white dress and the horror that struck me right away. I wanted to drive 120 miles per hour, but I couldn't drive faster than maybe 20 because of all the fog. So it felt like we drove for hours, which I'm sure wasn't more than 10 minutes. And then suddenly, fog is clearing up, and we're at a crossroad near a village close to mine. Because of the panic, I couldn't memorize everything properly, and then I drive to my friend's house safe, and dropped him off and got home. Today, we're trying to find this road again to show a couple of friends who didn't believe us, but it is nowhere to be found. We even drove to the same village at the exact same location where we dialed in the GPS, but it did not show that lost road as an alternative. I have always been able to pick up and sense things. It's kind of random. Most things I keep to myself, because in my experience, it makes people uncomfortable. That's another post though. The first time I saw the hat man, I was 8 years old, about 1970. I lived with my parents and two sisters. I shared a room with my middle sister. It was late. I knew everyone was in bed and sleeping. I feel this memory like it happened yesterday, and I think thinking about him will open up that part of me that's sensitive to that kind of energy. It's scary. The terror and just the sense of having been watched. The energy or vibe of badness, wrongness, and or just a darkness. Hard to convey the shock that I felt when I knew I wasn't dreaming. I woke up and in the doorway, I saw a man with a long black overcoat, kind of like one of the old western duster coats. He had on a fedora hat with a large brim. I couldn't see his face clearly, it was in shadow, but the nightlight from the bathroom lit him from behind. He crooked his right index finger, motioning me to him. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, and he was still there. It seemed like he was closer to me then. He was still backlit from the nightlight. I remember looking at him getting closer, closing my eyes, and saying the Our Father prayer. When I opened my eyes again, I didn't see him, but I knew he was still there. The energy or feeling was still there and very strong. I knew I shouldn't have got out of bed or tried to run across the hall or else he would somehow get me, or so I thought at the time. I don't remember how long I sat there in my bed. It seemed like a long time. 
I finally got up the courage to run to my parents' room. Don't think my feet even touched the floor. I woke my parents. The police came. The house was searched. Neighbors all on alert. No signs of anything or anyone. I remember distinctly seeing my parents, their friends, grandparents, in little groups huddle up talking, looking at me. I don't think anyone believed me, and they thought I might be incapacitated in some way. It was close to five or six years before I would sleep alone in a room, much less by myself in a bed. Now all these years later, I've had a few incidents recently that brought it home again. Thanks for reading. After lurking around the site ever since the same age this happened, I finally decided to write out what happened to me 10 years ago. The following experience is my very first paranormal encounter, though not the only one. When I was in third grade, I lived in the city of Spring, Texas, which is a suburb about 18 miles north of Houston. The subdivision this happened in was Oak Creek Village, Old Oaks. At one corner of the subdivision, near my house, there is a forest, and if you continue along the main path for about 10 minutes, you'll reach a clearing in which there is a small river with a large drainage tube with its mouth open perpendicular to the side of water. A neighborhood friend and his dad showed me how to get there, and I often rode my bike to the location to explore around. One holiday weekend, my mother invited a boy in my class named Steven to our home. As he was my only friend from school, I went to a school outside of our neighborhood because my mom taught there, and the nearby school wasn't very good. After playing baseball a bit, I told him about the forest, and he agreed to ride there on my scooter with me as I rode my bike. When we got to the clearing, we slid down the grass hill to get to the river, and Steven stepped on the rocks atop the water to enter the drainage tube as I watched from the grass nearby. About 20 seconds later, he walked out, looking quite bewildered, and said, I just heard a gunshot in there. Being a brave child, and since I hadn't heard a gunshot, I wanted to investigate, so I walked on top of the rocks and peered into the drainage tube as Stephen stood behind me, seven or so feet away, not in vision of the inside of the tube. I had planned on walking inside the tube, but stopped because of what I saw. Inside the tube, about 50 feet away, was a glowing white figure, and though fuzzy-ish, was clearly in the shape of a human, as I could make out a head, shoulders, arms, legs, and torso, though there were no details. It was only an outline of mostly a man. Unable to comprehend what I was seeing, I could only stare at it in quizzical wonder. I started to look around the figure, but there was only darkness. It didn't appear as though anything, but the figure was inside the tunnel, and no noise whatsoever could be heard. I continued to stare at the figure, and saw that it appeared to be walking around within a small area, occasionally bending out and then standing back up. It seemed to be looking for something on the ground. As I continued to stare, I felt like it was gradually coming closer, at which point I realized, isn't that a ghost? Only having heard the word mentioned a few times before, and in scary stories, I started to worry about the danger of glowing figure behind me, so I stepped back, faced Stephen, and told him what I was seeing. His eyes widened, and he told me we should get out of here, so we ran as fast as we could, and raced on my bike and scooter back to my home. Though I remember having a small interest before, this experience is what truly got me into the paranormal, and what led me to this very site 10 years ago. Though I've been back to the location several times after, as it is dangerous, I haven't ever stepped on the rocks leading into the tube since then. My own theory is that it was the ghost of a man who had died in the tunnel, or nearby, and the gunshot was the sound of what had killed him. Though now an uninhabited and empty forest, I later found a mountain of bricks that I felt had been used to build a house in the clearing long ago. I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and went to school with lots of the country music stars kids. This afforded me some rather unique experiences, and one of those is how I came to encounter a ghost. There is a hotel in Watrice, Tennessee, called the Walking Horse Hotel. 
I know it is still there because I visited it yesterday with my wife and kids on the way back to Atlanta from visiting family in Nashville. The property has changed dramatically on the inside, but as soon as I saw the outline of the building, I knew that it was it. It was in the early 1980s, and I was invited to go with some of my friends and one adult, the wife of a very prominent country music star, to stay New Year's Eve as the guest of the manager of Unique Hotel located in Tennessee, Walking Horse Country. We were to be the only people in the hotel as it was closed that evening. My friends had stayed there in the recent past and had some interesting experiences. This particular hotel was the resting place of Strutting Jim, one of the most famous Tennessee walking horses of all time. His trainer Floyd had lived in the hotel and sometime after the horse's passing had died himself in his room on the third floor of the three-story hotel. Floyd was still said to be wandering the grounds in the halls of the hotel, but our host George, the manager of the property, assured us that he was always friendly and had not harmed anyone. We arrived mid-evening after stopping for dinner on the way and enjoyed a nice quiet evening. We spent most of the evening looking at the amazing walking horse artwork that hung on almost every square inch of the lobby and main staircase. It was shortly after midnight. We had been listening to George's tales of encounters from other guests when everyone started settling down to sleep. I was feeling a bit brave and still wasn't as sold as the others on the authenticity of Floyd the Ghost, so we decided to go up and sit in his room on the third floor to see if anything would happen. I sat on the bed in almost total darkness and waited for Floyd. When I opened my eyes, I was laying on the bed. Still fully dressed in clothes and shoes and day was just breaking. I knew that I had fallen asleep and that there had been no visit from Floyd. I went downstairs to find George, starting to put together breakfast and the others were just starting to mill about. George suggested we go out and see Strutting Jim's grave marker and stretch our legs before breakfast. As we headed out to the back pasture to visit the stables and grave, it all seemed strangely familiar. As we approached a fenced-in area on the side of the pasture, I stopped George and asked how long the English sheepdogs had lived there. He looked rather surprised, as we had not been out there the night before, and there had been no mention of the dogs. But sure enough, they came running up to the fence and started barking and looking directly at me. We then proceeded to the stables where the grave marker was, and there were a few horses kept. As we approached one of the stables, George told us all to stay clear of the big black one as he bit anyone he didn't know. The black horse immediately came to me and started nuzzling my head and stamping his feet in excitement. We then walked over to the grave marker and I led the way as if I had been going there for years. By now, even George was blown away with all of this and when asked, I responded that I slept in Floyd's room but didn't remember leaving the bed all night. We all walked back to the hotel, talking about the strange events, and without asking, I walked directly in the rear kitchen door like I owned the place. We had not been anywhere near this area of the hotel for our visit, but I knew exactly where to go. We all sat down in the dining room, and George asked who would like biscuits with honey to start. I jumped up and stated that these were the best biscuits in the world, and everyone should have some. George asked how I knew this since this was my first visit and we had arrived after dinner the night before. I walked straight into the kitchen, opened a pantry, reached up to a tin on the third shelf and opened it up to reveal a tin full of the very biscuits. That pretty much sealed the deal. It is my assumption that Floyd took me for a little spin the night before, using my body as a vehicle to get to his favorite places and get some of his favorite food. I am still not quite sure what to make of this incredible event, but I know that I now believe that there are some people who just aren't ready to go on to heaven or whatever awaits them and they are still here on earth with us. On my visit yesterday, it was so disappointing to learn that the new proprietor had gutted the hotel, changed the entire layout, losing the lobby and grand staircase, and didn't believe that any of the tales about Floyd were anything more than poppycock. The entire feel of the place was different, and I hope Floyd has moved on to his eternal resting place. I know the memory of that incredible day will always be with me. When I was 14, 
My family transferred from Danbury, Connecticut to Zimbago, Maine for my mom's work. My parents bought a farmhouse with an attached barn so we could keep our horses on the property. I was a freshman in high school and my sister was a few years behind me. Almost immediately, I began seeing, out of the corner of my eye, someone walk past the bathroom door and go down the stairs. But when I looked straight down the stairs, no one was there. This would happen every morning as I was getting ready to go to school. As the months and even years progressed, I'd witnessed voices having conversations that I couldn't make out. I heard banging and footsteps coming from the second floor when no one was up there and a voice calling me by name and demanding that I come to it when I was the only person in the house. I did not have the courage to come to the voice, so I stood there until my father came inside the house. There was also the time I was in the barn with the horses and was enveloped by the stench of decaying flesh. No dead animal could be found in the vicinity of the barn. During the summer of 1992, I was 17 and working for a family camping resort in the general store. I remember being asleep and being woken up by a man's voice in my ear. He said, wake up and hear the storm. I can still remember feeling the vibration of his words in my ear and being puzzled by what I had just heard. I sat up in my bed and was afraid that there was someone in my room with me. My father was the only man in the house and I was positive that it was not his voice that I heard. Beside the fact that I didn't hear my door open or close, so I was sure that whoever had spoken to me hadn't left yet. Lightning was coming down outside and I could hear the horses whining, so I got out of bed and tried for the light, but the power was out. I stumbled down the stairs and saw that my father was in bed sleeping. I took a flashlight with me to the barn and saw that the horses were outside loose. One horse had broken through the fencing and the others were running around, panicked by the storm. Thanks to the voice, I was able to gather up all of the horses and put them in their stalls safe and sound. It was the only time that the spirits were helpful to me. Thanks for reading. I'm an experienced ghost and demon hunter. That is a big claim, but I can offer eyewitnesses if needed. I want to share my first real encounter. I was 15 and my family saved for months to rent a vacation home on Cape Cod. It was in the little village of Warham near Onset and the whole area was made up of vacation homes. When we got there, I was excited and immediately ran into the house only to run through a wall of cold. The cold got in and took over my mind. I was pushed to the back of my mind and this other being thought through me and touched things with my body. The entity actually held a conversation with me about what she'd remember things being like in her day. The strangest part of this was that my vision changed. I wear glasses, but she took them off. Also, all colors paled into a weird black and white vision. I was terrified. No matter how I squirmed, I could not break loose. My mother called me outside, and as she went to see who my mother was, my body crossed the threshold of the door and the entity was popped out. I was panicked, but what could I do? Saying nothing, I built a wall up in my head that said simply no. When my little brother and sister went upstairs, they soon came down screaming that a dead hand had reached into the open window. I had not told anyone about my encounter, but my no strategy was working, so I cradled them in my arms and said no to the ghost for them as well. My baby sister was stationed in a crib in my room. She often woke up about 2 or 3 a.m. screaming. I got good at waking up when the presence got near and throwing my proactive no over the baby too. We had so much poltergeist activity in that house. Like the salt and pepper shakers would fly off the fridge and onto the table. My mom would put things away, turn around, and they would be back. We also experienced knocks, footsteps, and bad smells. And when my cousin came to visit, he stuck his head through the open window that led from the TV room to the porch, a window that was jammed all three of us could not budge it, and it slammed down on his head. At the end of the week, I finally told my mom about the encounter I had. She believed me and went to see the realtor we had leased the house from. He casually told us that the reason we got the house so cheap was because it was haunted. 
a woman had been murdered there 20 years ago. We rented that house out a couple more times. Since we knew it was haunted, we would say hello to the ghost. My mom felt bad for her when we got there. It was never an easy thing for me, as she often tried to get into my head or talk to me. I built up my auric protection from that experience, but I was very afraid of ghosts for a long time afterwards. As will happen, ghosts were very interested in me. Then demons started being put in my path. It is one thing to believe in ghosts, but it took much convincing and hand wriggling to accept that there are demons. For every encounter with the demonic, I've had to reach deeper into old myths and religious writings to tease out what the ancients knew. I am not a devouted Catholic, although I was raised to be. That path never held answers for me, or I should not say enough answers. Yet I became an ordained minister of universal light. I know there is a great spiritual mind, a great source, and sometimes that source appears to me as female, sometimes male, sometimes both, or neither. I died a few times as a child due to what I now know was demonic attacks. When I gave birth to my daughter, I had complications and bled to death. That journey took me to the great source, in a word, to love. But not love as an attachment to a person, idea, or pet. Love as an infinite ocean of creation. I was immersed in this oceanic experience while the Great One spoke to me. It was really more like receiving direct knowing. He, she, said it was my choice to go back on or move on. That I had a hard life in addition to my non-stop illnesses. I had been abused in every sense of the word. And it was fine to let go. My children would do fine without me. I was needed, but not necessary. If I chose to go back, however, I would be sent teachers and would fulfill certain duties for the balance. I would be a teacher and healer and have the tools and gifts I needed as such. In this place I had no ego, no desire. I was awish in love. I looked down at my daughter, not three minutes old, and chose to go back for her and my son. As was told to me, within a year my teachers showed up. Also, the demon showed up. Those first few years were dedicated to clearing out my mind and personal history. As I came to know my personal demons, a correlating world demon would make itself known. At first I did nothing but observe and clear myself. After practicing mindfulness for nearly eight years and having the help and teachings of a medicine man, a Buddhist nun, a master therapist, and a couple of gurus, the universe gave me the nod and people literally started showing up at my doorstep. I worked with people on many levels for many years. I worked with hauntings and cast out some demons from buildings. I've not done an exorcism yet, as one has not been in my path, and I do not go searching for these things. I cannot say I would know where to begin, but for gods of grace, guidance, it can happen. I've trapped destructive forces and banished them or helped them transmute. The people involved always have dramatic changes even the ones who don't know what happened. I've had spiritual duels with practitioners of dark arts and removed hexes and lesser known demonic attachments, but the hunter can become the hunted. I caught some backlash from a few entanglements that involved black magic and ghosts that stuck into my car and followed me home. Before I knew what hit me, I was really sick with an undiagnosable problem of my nervous system. I had to leave the city move to Vermont and get involved with horses to ground me and bring my being back to life. For the last three years, I've done nothing but heal and surround myself with nature. Some very tricky forces have challenged me here, as Vermont is ripe with haunting and strange energies, but I have not worked the public more than a few times. Now, I am ready again. I am also ready to learn new things. I would love to talk to others who have had any experiences like my own. Please feel free to contact me, and thank you for my very long read. I first got into the paranormal on October 16th, 2011, when it was my 11th birthday and my mom and I went on a ghost tour of a war of 1812 forts and saw a strange shadow. Since then, 
I've created my own paranormal group and expect to ghost hunt many haunted places like the Waverly Hills Sanatorium in the future. Today, technically this night of October 24th, my granddad took me on a ghost tour which had a bunch of people get led around a small part of Jordan Village in southern Ontario. There was this one point we got to go to a nice winery building known as the Cave Spring Winery or Cave Spring Wine Shop. Here, we got to descend down into the cellars here. Before that, we were informed about the three main spirits here. One was a nice female spirit named Margaret, the other was an unnamed male malevolent entity, and the other was a horse who was said to have had a heart attack and you could hear the hooves on the cement clip-clopping along. Anyways, our group of 30 or so people headed down to the tunnels and we learned a bit more of the history and discovered we could enter one of the supposedly haunted tunnels where screams and voices have been reported. When I went in there with my grandpa and two women on the tour, it was just four of us because we went four at a time. It was somewhat chilly. At first we didn't hear anything, just looking around for a moment then taking pictures. Then it happened. There was a loud clang right near us. It was as if someone picked up a sewer grate and dropped it right by us. We thought that they were closing the door on us and we'd investigate the tunnel alone, but the door was open and the tour guide didn't seem to be reacting to the sound. Then it happened again. The same loud clang, maybe a bit louder, only a second or two after the first one. It was getting a bit closer to us now. Moments later, there was a third clang. I didn't get a negative feeling, but more shocked like, wow, that's interesting. Once the tour was over, I spoke to the guide about it. She claimed she didn't hear a thing, nor did the rest of the tour group. But they were so loud, someone besides us must have heard it, but there was no noise. The Cave Spring Winery is in operation on the upper floors, sometimes busy, but the floor is thick and we were at least 10 plus feet underground. It would be very difficult for sound to get through. Even so, it wouldn't sound like it was close by. It would be muffled. The tunnel didn't have any vents for noise to travel through, and there was only a staircase way out on the other end of the tunnel. It would be practically impossible for a noise like that to get through. Can I verify what we heard was paranormal? No. I can't conclude it was paranormal. But based on the evidence gathered with thick walls and a thick floor above us, and nobody but us four in the tunnel were able to hear these three loud noises, there might be something there. I've heard stuff about these knocks or scratches means a demonic presence and yes, I do believe demons do exist. Was this a demon? This is somewhat unlikely. I'm a bit paranormal sensitive. I can't tell when a spirit has entered the room. And when I have encountered a negative entity, which I have before at a local cemetery, not in Jordan. If this were a demon, I would probably feel the negative presence as a very, very uncomfortable feeling in my chest. I have a slight heavy feeling in my chest when a good spirit is in the room, not wanting to do harm, probably just making itself known. If this were a ghost, I guess it was Margaret as she wants people to acknowledge her presence. Personally. I would recommend taking this tour to where you'd have to speak to someone at the Jordan Historical Museum and the tours sell out fast and are usually in October. Of course, to put you in the mood for Halloween, there are people dressed up and hiding behind trees and stand there silently to freak you out. Many places on the tour had ghost reports surrounding them, but I do believe the Cave Springs winery is haunted. It was the beginning of December when I received a phone call from my father in Orange, California. He explained to me that my grandmother had a heart attack and that she was in the hospital. After the phone call, I packed a few days worth of clothing and started the six hour trip to California. Upon my arrival at St. Joseph's Hospital, I checked in and visited my grandma Sally. She seemed to be doing okay, but had to stay in the hospital for testing and for shortness of breath. I stayed with her that whole weekend, then had to make the trip back to go to work. I did this for three weeks. Each week I visited her, she began to look worse and her breathing was getting shorter. The last week of her life, I can recall the doctor letting us know that she had cancer and her lungs were hardening, unable to take breaths. After weeping for some time, we lied to her and told her she would be fine and be out in time for Christmas. 
That last weekend, I can clearly remember being in the room with her and noticed her staring at a chair. But the time, I did not think anything of it. She would ask me to stay with her because she was so scared. I asked her why she was so scared and she explained to me in Spanish that there was a guy in black in the chair, sitting by her feet, sticking his big tongue out at her and throwing spider webs at her. I could tell she was scared. That evening, I grabbed her holy water from home and bought some saints for her room. It was a very uncomfortable feeling when I would go into that hospital room, seeing my grandmother focusing on that chair. I eventually had her moved to a room in front of the nurse's desk. The following morning, they transferred her out to a hospice where she died two days later. My dad says she would tell him she could hear singing right before she died. First off, I'd like to say that I really appreciate your site. So far, I found a lot of interesting things to read and learn. It's great to read other people's tales of true hauntings because in a way, it's like sharing war stories with other veterans. These tales, if nothing else, really make a person think. I've always religiously believed in the supernatural. Too many strange and bizarre things have happened in my life for me not to. These are just two of the more interesting ones that I hope you and other readers will find mystifying and enjoyable. During the summer of 1995, I lived in Washington, D.C., where my father had rented an apartment suite at the Watergate. It was a very nice apartment, right across from the Kennedy Center on one side and a hop and a skip away from Georgetown on the other, and since the apartment was at ground level, had a nice fenced-in patio area just several yards away from the main pool. I was working as a White House intern and was just enjoying the first real summer away from parental guidance. After a time, however, I came to realize that I really wasn't as alone as I had thought. Upstairs were two bedrooms, the master and a smaller one right across the landing. At first, I decided to take the master because after all, bigger is supposed to be better. But I quickly changed my mind because, in the dead of night, I'd feel suddenly very cold and very uneasy, as if someone was standing near my bed, its dark, shadowy presence vaguely menacing. I didn't know who or what it was. All I really knew was that it was big, male, and didn't seem to like me as much as a roomie. After two nights of this, and getting very little rest, I moved my stuff across the landing to the other bedroom. Anyway, about this time, my roommate and best friend from college came to visit for a while and, without telling her of my own unsettling experiences, offered her the master bedroom. The very next day, she reported the same unnerving sensations. She told me that during the night, she felt someone breathing cool air on her cheek and felt a heaviness on her chest that both scared and kept her awake all night. After that, she promptly moved her things into my room as well. Since I knew what she was talking about, I graciously gave in, and the two of us were very careful to never enter that room unless we absolutely had to and only in broad daylight. Summer came to an end, and we both got ready to head back to college. As I was in the bedroom packing, I suddenly heard her calling my name from across the landing. At first, I was puzzled because it was unspoken between us that we would never enter that room, and since we didn't have anything in there to pack, I hesitated before answering. Finally, I crossed the landing and entered into the master bedroom, calling out, Yeah, what do you need? When I walked in the room, nobody was there. Chilled by the episode, I went downstairs, calling my roommate's name. I finally found her in the kitchen area, the furthest part away in the house from the master bedroom. When I told her what happened, she shook her head in bewilderment and told me that she hadn't called my name and was, in fact, inside the pantry room, packing up some canned goods. When she told me that, my back stiffened and an eerie shiver ran down my spine. Needless to say, we got the heck out of Dodge. An interesting postscript to this tale came near the end of 1998. My mother had been diagnosed with liver cancer in May, and in a desperate bid to lengthen her life, she had decided to become a Buddhist nun. She dressed in the traditional nun's garb and shaved her head, but at the end of September, she passed away, unfortunately. During this time, a close friend of hers was in D.C. and so stayed at the Watergate apartment. 
She had not seen my mother in over a year, and in fact, did not even know that my mother had just died less than a week ago. She unpacked and fell asleep in the master bedroom. Around midnight, she awoke because, as she told my father later on, she felt and saw an enormous shadow sitting on her chest, cutting off her breath. She couldn't scream because of the weight, and for a second, thought she was dying. She struggled and fought, but the shadow wouldn't budge, and she finally drew in one breath and cried out for help. Immediately, she said she was blinded by a light coming from the closet door, and as the light drew closer and nearer to the bed, she felt the weight suddenly dissipate, the shadow fleeing from the unearthly glow. She opened her eyes and saw a woman standing next to her, brown robes flowing to the ground. Instantly, she said she knew it was my mother, but the only thing that made her wonder was the fact that this woman, this friend she had known for years, was shaved bald. The glowing woman then smiled gently at her and slowly disappeared. Only after this friend of my mother's had told my father about this incident did she learn that, indeed, the day my mother died, she had died with a clean-shaven head, dressed in brown robes. The second place I experienced a haunting was when I lived in a two-story house on the south side of Las Vegas. The house was owned by a chief in one of the casinos near the strip and was completely furnished as advertised. As I came from a traditional Asian household, my grandmother also lived with me and my father, and since he was frequently away on business, it was just the two of us there most of the time. The first week we moved in, my grandmother discovered very fine, very black sand would accumulate near the tiled fireplace, and since we didn't ever use the fireplace, we thought it was rather strange. She would sweep it up, throw it away, but the next day, it would appear again. This happened for about four days in a row. My grandmother, bless her heart, is a Capricorn, and thus, rather anal about things. She was forever checking doors and windows, making sure they were locked and secured whenever we left the house, so when we came home one day from shopping, we were shocked to see the front door standing wide open. We always came through the garage door, so it was very unsettling to see the door open, knowing we had locked it before leaving. And since the front entrance is protected on one side by the garage, we knew the wind could not have done this. Nothing had been stolen or otherwise disturbed. We ended up not talking about it because really, what was there to talk about? And put it down to a freak of nature. During this time, my father came home from his trip and stayed in the master bedroom. Now my father is not a man that is given to sudden wild and unexplained imaginings. He's 6'2", weighs nearly 200 pounds, and is perhaps one of the most self-assured men I have ever known. But after a week in that room, he abruptly confessed to me one day that there was something else staying in that bedroom with him. He said that whenever he closed his eyes to sleep, he would feel as if someone or something was staring at him through the darkness, and he would then have to get up and sleep with the lights on. At first, I just thought that was ridiculous. I mean, the man had faced down a robber at gunpoint, and he had to sleep with the light on? I smiled and nodded, but didn't think much of it because this was Vegas, not some creepy little Stephen King town filled with outlaw boogeyman. But after he left again, and I decided to stay in the master bedroom, he had cable, I quickly changed my mind, because as I snapped off the light, I too felt something peering at me through the shadows. It wasn't the same as it was in DC. This one was just as unsettling, to be sure, but it wasn't as menacing, just very disturbing. It was almost like it wanted me to notice it, had something it wanted to tell me, and as I turned on the light, I couldn't help but feel that it also needed to do something. Finally, one night, I sat up in bed and asked it, Okay, what do you want? I've had some prior experience with channeling, and this wasn't the first time I had encountered a restless spirit, so I just bluntly asked it what it wanted of me so I could finally get a decent night's nice sleep. When I closed my eyes in exhausted semi-consciousness, it was around 3 a.m. at this time, I saw behind my closed eyelids the pale figure of a woman dressed in white with long brown hair down her back. To be honest, I didn't really believe what I was seeing, just thought it was a product of first stage REM cycle. I don't really remember what she looked like, just that she was slender and had curious stains on her white dress. She looked to be in her late 20s to mid 30s. She told me that she had been taken out to the desert, raped, 
strangled and buried in the sand where the present house stood. Again, I don't know how much of this is true because I was nearly asleep at the time, but what I can say with certainty was that the spirit was obviously distressed by the manner of her demise and I felt very sad for her. Later on, I told my grandmother about this and as she burned paper money for my mother, a traditional act in Asian countries, she would be sure to burn some for the woman in white as well. She would burn the paper money and plead at the same time for this nice lady to not come out and frighten her while she was alone in the house. I thought it was highly amusing at the time and just indulged her whimsical actions. To me, it had been a very vivid dream, and as I was not the owner of the house, I certainly couldn't come up and dig around the property to substantiate the ghostly claims. After six months, the owner of the house was ready to move back in with his family, and so me and my grandmother packed up and moved to the west side. Another three months passed before I got a call. It was the owner of the house, and he had a very strange story to tell me. First off, he asked me if when I had lived there, did anything weird happen while I was there? Honestly, I did tell him yes, then told him about what I experienced and concluded that I thought the house was haunted. He agreed, telling me that the doors had started to open by themselves and that he would hear strange noises at night. Finally, he asked me to speak to his girlfriend because she had a most peculiar dream last night and needed to tell me about it. When she got on the phone, she told me that last night she had dreamed she had walked downstairs to the garage and met a young black-haired woman dressed in a white dress. The woman asked her if I was there because she needed to speak to me. Puzzled, the owner's girlfriend said that sorry, but no, they moved away. The woman in white had gotten agitated at the response and then asked, Well, is the grandmother there then? Again, she replied no, she's gone too. At this point, the woman in white became exceedingly upset and started to shout, But I know she's there. I know, and I need to speak to her now. Please, you've got to let me talk to her. The owner's girlfriend was shocked at the desperation in the other woman's voice and kept repeating, Sorry, but they're not here. Finally, she woke up, sweat pouring down her face, and immediately asked the owner to contact me. I really wish that I could tell you that there's a proper ending to all of this, but since I never went back to the house, nor my grandmother, I don't know what happened in the end. I just thought it was thoroughly bizarre that something which I had convinced myself was just a dream was actually probably based in some reality. Perhaps one day, I'll get the courage to go back there and tell him what the woman in white had told me. I still think about the poor woman at times, wondering if she's still on her quest to find some sort of justice or peace, and I hope that time really will heal all wounds. I just know that I've been blessed in the sense that I've been given opportunities to touch a world seldom seen by rational people, and hopefully this will not be a trend that will soon break. I also wish that I could include father's incidents that have raised my eyebrows a notch or two, but I think that I've taken up enough of your time. Thank you for listening. Oh, and by the way, my grandmother still burns paper money for the lady in white. She's convinced the poor soul will come after her if she doesn't. I was reading through your website, and it gave me the confidence to speak out about what I saw as a child. At age 12, I saw the angel of death, or what have you. I witnessed him come to a woman whom I had no knowledge of or have ever spoken with, take her away by giving her direct eye contact. Here's what happened. It was before summer in 1989. My family was poor, and we were being evicted from an apartment in Washington, D.C. We had to go to court to talk about it with the judge. In the waiting room at the courthouse in D.C., there was a woman sitting beside me with a large oxygen tank and a mask over her mouth. She was really heavy and she wore a purple flower dress. I sat beside her. I remember I noticed her oxygen tank and wondered what was wrong with her. Then I heard a knock on the glass, which was right behind me. The seating arrangement was like the chairs were facing the waiting area, but your back was to a glass wall that if you looked through, you could see the security guards checking people in through an x-ray machine. I looked up when I heard a knock. Three knocks. 
Then I looked up, and so did the other woman with the oxygen tank. We looked up at the same time. The angel of death looked at me with eye contact, then looked directly at her. He stared for about three seconds at both of us, me first, and then her. When he looked at her, she wheezed a big, uh, then she fell on the ground in front of her chair. People, adults, started running to her and they said, get those kids out of here. And I just kept saying, you did not see that man scare her? Then I looked down the long hallway. He walked down and only saw his long black coat that looks like what judges wear. A black hat, black cape or cloak, and black shoes from the back. He did not look back and his arms were swinging. When I ran to catch up with him, he was gone. The security said no one came in with all black on, and they insisted I was crazy and to take me home. I still remember how he looks. He was a medium complexion black guy that was medium built and was older looking. The woman was white. This is a true story. And I'm not just saying that because I want you guys to believe this. It's because it is true. Thank you for reading. This is only one example of an encounter I had in a house I lived in. My daughter was only about six months old, and my husband and I were living with his parents at the time. On one particular morning, he had left for work, and I decided to lay on the couch until my baby woke up. I left the door to the upstairs open as well as our bedroom door, so I could hear when she woke. I fell asleep on the couch. Shortly after I fell asleep, something woke me. As I opened my eyes and looked up, I saw what appeared to be someone wearing a black hooded robe going towards the stairs. I watched the figure. I sat there frozen. Turn and go upstairs. At this point, I was freaking out. My baby is up there. I got up and started running towards the stairs, and I yelled for my mother-in-law to help. She was sleeping in the room off of the dining room. When I got upstairs and went into the nursery, my baby was lying there, limp with her eyes rolling in the back of her head. I grabbed her and ran downstairs. She was lifeless. We put 7-Up soda in her bottle and forced it into her and left it for the hospital. By the time we reached the doctor, she was okay. No one could explain what had happened. When they looked at her at the hospital, they thought we were nuts. She was laughing and having a great time, getting all of the attention. So, what was that? Had I beaten the angel of death? Or was she in trouble and that spirit was warning me? Whatever it was, thank God I still have my daughter. A little after 8 p.m., I was in bed, exhausted and waiting for my husband to come back from the kitchen with snacks. I dozed off for a few seconds and when I opened my eyes, I saw a hunched over figure carrying what looked like a walking stick. He was standing sideways so I saw his left side only, but his hair was gray and must, and he was wearing a ratty, moldy-looking cloak around his shoulders and partially over his head. As I stared, he just faded away. It was really disturbing. I didn't know if it was a dream or what. My husband came back a few seconds later, and I didn't know what to do. Finally, I told him, and he joked that it was the angel of death. I thought he looked a little like the guy from Akalog, death row toll cover, but not quite. The next morning, my daughter told me first thing to call dad immediately. His older brother in Italy passed away that morning. I asked what time, his time and our time. I saw him about four hours before he passed. The strange thing is that even though there are 11 children, the only other sibling, another brother, passed away 28 years earlier on the exact same day. I've not seen him again, but I've experienced visits by scent mostly, and he has visited a few times, mostly to tell the other siblings to call Italy and take care of his widow. I had spent time with this man, and he really liked me and even gave me a memento of his. I believe he somehow knew I could see things others couldn't. He knew I could, and did, carry out his message to my husband and for him to make sure his siblings stay in touch with her too. Oh, and by the way, he did have a stick that he used to carry with him. 
Upon ever thinking of the paranormal, my initial feeling is fear. I am not, maybe never will be, comfortable with my encounters with the supernatural. I've always been what you would call overly scared when it comes to the subject of ghosts, but that doesn't stop the supernatural from paying my frightened self to many visits. For some odd reason, most of my encounters have been while being just in the midst of falling asleep, or they will wake me out of my sleep. For this reason, I've always tried to convince myself that they were just my imagination. I've come to cope with the fact that they have been happening more frequently. The past homes I've lived in have been older homes, so you would think that if I were having encounters, the history of the home would be to blame. But I now live in a newer home, and I'm recently being visited by a close friend of mine who passed away almost two years ago. My first encounter when I was about 13. I was lying in bed, almost asleep, when I heard what I thought was my little sister talking and playing in my room. I told her sternly, Holly, get out of my room. But when the little voice in rummaging through my belongings in the corner didn't stop, I opened my eyes only to see that the little voice wasn't my sister's. It was a little girl whose face I couldn't really make out being that she was a little ball of light. Some of her features were distinctive, but I could clearly tell what was happening. I jumped out of my bed and ran for dear life. My mother is a big fan of the supernatural and always says, Elizabeth, you should try to talk to them if you see them. Ask them what they want. Is she crazy? My first experience made me run, much less strike up a conversation. We eventually moved into a much older home where I experienced a lot of lights turning on and off by themselves and the frequent sounds of someone walking up and down the hardwood stairs. But I grew used to it and never had any more visual experiences until recently. My closest friend, Morgan, passed away in a car accident almost two years ago at the young age of 18. I believe that she hasn't crossed over because she is confused. Her life was taken so quickly that I believe she is lost and she is now visiting me. She has come to me two times in the past month and I have a feeling that she's going to come again. Anytime I have an encounter, it scares the wits out of me. Again, this encounter came in the midst of falling asleep. I was actually having a dream about her and I don't know if it was a noise that woke me up, but in my groggy state, I opened my eyes and someone was standing in front of me. I know it was her, but couldn't make her out. I heard her talking to me, but it was very muffled. I was scared to death, of course, so I closed my eyes and tried to fall back asleep, blowing it off as my imagination, until I woke up. The same night, I was having yet another dream about her. I'm a very light sleeper, so any noise, touch, etc. will wake me up. While dreaming of her, I popped awake instantly while catching a chill and having something touch my back in the dead darkness of the night. I tried to scream, but nothing came out, so I hugged my infant son closer and went back to sleep. My way of dealing with my encounters is to be very still, if you call that dealing. I would like to not be so fearful of the supernatural, much less my best friend. Please help if you can. My parents found a house to rent in a beautiful location off the Appalachian Trail for an extremely good price. Half of the house was fairly new and the other half was very old, put together with wooden pegs instead of nails. The first odd thing we noticed was that one area of the lawn which was enclosed by a stone wall was constantly sticky and covered in flies. Then we started to hear balls bouncing and what sounded like children running up and down the hallway. Every night the front door would open and close, followed by the door into the kitchen and around the corner to the side door going out. My dog refused to go into the old part of the house and would urinate if we forced her. Things continued to escalate to the point where canned goods would fly off the shelves. My brother's closet door would slam open and shut rapidly and we'd be woken up by faceless children. My father refused to believe anything was going on and always had some rational explanation for it. That is until he was asked by the landlord to replace the floor in the living room. When he opened the hatch to access the crawl space, a fireball of electricity shot out at him, which he ignored. But when we went down the ladder, we found a small dirt room about four feet high, 
and it was a stone slab approximately six feet long, with a groove carved around the edge and forming a sort of stone spout at one end. The next day we came home to find four of our birds with their necks snapped in their cage, and a mirror flew off the wall at my brother. My parents packed what would fit in the car, and we moved to a campground until we found another place to live. Whatever was in that house, I don't believe was a ghost, but something evil and dangerous. It all started when my fiancé and I bought a new house. It's actually a few houses down from my mother's home, where we've also had chilling tales. Our houses are directly across the street from an old cemetery. Upon moving in, we had odd things happen. It started off where my dogs would stare into my dark hallway, always around 3 a.m., and growl and raise their fur. It always gave me a sinking feeling. I was taking a shower not long after the dog incident, and something touched my shoulder. I ran out of the shower, soap in my hair and eyes screaming. My fiancé said the look of terror on my face made him think someone was in our house and caused him to panic. A few weeks later, I heard a low whisper while in the shower, and I ran out in terror again. The icing on the cake is about to take place. I was out on my back porch, cleaning and organizing things, when on my back door, I heard a loud slam on the glass, so loud I expected it to shatter. I ran outside, couldn't even speak. I was so horrified, and again, my fiancé thought an intruder was inside. There was nobody around. We live on a dead-end street in good neighborhood. I wasn't expecting a human to be the cause. Fast forward to a few weeks later, and we decided to put a fence in the backyard to keep my dogs contained. Upon building said fence, my fiancé unearthed a gravestone in our backyard. It was dated from 1851 and appears to be from a young girl. I have a photo on my phone. After finding the gravestone, things escalated. I would be on my treadmill in the bedroom, and something would touch my shoulder. I started seeing shadow figures and hearing creepy, low voices. My animals usually picked up on a presence, too. I had the majority of the experiences, but I think it's due to the fact that I'm the woman of the house, and she's looking for a mother figure. I own a duplex and rent out the other half. My past two tenants and Kurt ones all had their own ghost stories and said it was haunted. I mentioned my mother's house is a few houses away, built along the same cemetery near my house. Well, she called one day after getting home from work at 11.30 at night. She was almost in tears, saying she entered her kitchen and said she's heard the creepiest voice that sent chills down her spine. She's lived on her own for 20 years and wouldn't even enter her own house. She was horrified. My fiancé and I came right over and went through her entire house, but nobody was there. When I was a child and we had just moved into that house, she called the police before because it would sound like someone had a baseball bat and was beating on the outside of the house, but of course, nobody was ever there. I still live in my house with the gravestone we unearthed. The gravestone is still leaning against my house. I wasn't sure what to do with it. I didn't want to just desecrate it, so it's leaned against my house in my fenced-in dog pen. We also dug all around looking for a body, but I suppose didn't dig that deep, and we didn't dig the whole yard up. For all I know, there could have been a body in my yard. It was from 1851. It's quite possible the family buried their child in their yard. It's also possible the graveyard expanded to where my house is. Athol used to be a hot spot back in the 1800s. The pesky graveyard was taking up prime land, and folks wanted to build here. Just another thought of mine for why I have a gravestone in my yard, and all these creepy experiences. I can't remember the exact date. It was almost 25 years ago. I do remember it being in the summer, though. I was about the age of eight years old. My parents had a family friend pass away, and since they didn't have a sitter for me, I had to go along. I was afraid of dead bodies at the time, 
understandably since I was a child. I just sat at my seat and waited until my parents decided it was time to leave. I distinctly remember a brunette woman coming up and talking with me. She was wearing red heels, black tights, a black dress about down to her knees, a red and black suit looking shirt, and she had on earrings and a necklace. I cannot recall what they were exactly. I don't know why I can remember this woman so well, or why I can almost perfectly recall her exact outfit. She just took out in the crowd. She asked me what my name was. I told her Josh. She then asked me a few more questions about how I knew the deceased. I told her he was a family friend. She then proceeds to tell me that she is his wife. I thought maybe it was his daughter or another friend of the man's. She was a lot younger than him. Her exact words were, I know we will be together again very soon. At eight years old, I didn't know better. I was brought up to be friendly to strangers, and I just talked to her. Too many people around for her to try and kidnap me. I do remember everyone looking at me funny though, and giving me dirty looks. I didn't know why they were doing this. We sat there and talked a good 15 minutes or so. Someone must have said something to my parents about me. I remember when my mother told me they were leaving, she was griping at me that I should stop talking to myself. I told her I wasn't talking to myself, I was talking to the man's wife, who had died. She was talking to me. We still kind of mention this today and share a chuckle over it because even she says she remembers saying this. Josh, that isn't funny. That man's wife died. It was about 11pm. I had just gone into bed and turned on the TV. And after about five minutes, the TV turned off by itself and the telephone rang one time. It then felt like someone put their arm under my pillow and my head and shoulders were lifted up about 20 inches or so. I then yelled, oh god, and I was instantly dropped. Another time I woke up in the middle of the night and smelled a strong smell of urine. It was so strong smelling that I had peed myself, so I jumped out of bed and checked, but I hadn't. I then went to the bathroom to pee, and I saw a puddle of some liquid on the floor in front of the closet door. There was no reason for liquid to be there. I got paper towels to clean it up, and you could smell that it was strong urine. This worried me. I thought, did I do this in my sleep? It happened again a few nights later with the strong urine smell, and urine on the floor at the same spot. Sometimes I would get a whiff of urine throughout the day. I asked a friend that came over to smell me and tell me if I smelled like urine, and I didn't. I told him what was happening, and after a few days later, he brought me a book. He said he read the back of it, and when I did, I started crying because it said, if you smell urine in your house for no reason, that you have a demon in your house. Some people told me they saw a black shadow in my dining room, and some other weird stuff would go on from time to time. What got me was this was a new house that I had built. I sold it after living there for five years. I was very careful not to talk about moving because I did not want this thing coming with me. At one time, I did demand it to leave, and things did settle down somewhat after that, but I always felt like someone was watching me. It creeped me out when I would take a bath. Thanks for reading. I've seen or experienced ghosts or spirits most of my life. My family is from a small town in southern Louisiana, where just about everyone I knew either saw ghosts or had a family member who experienced such. When I started telling my parents about the things I felt, saw, and dreamed, I was encouraged. One of my parents would always say, Oh, your uncle sees, sees this ghost. And don't forget about your Aunt E. She lives in a haunted house and talks to spirits all the time. So when my most recent experience happened, I was not surprised. My aunt died on January 18th, 2016. She was 96 years old. And although it was sudden, I was happy that she didn't suffer and had lived on her own up until two weeks before her death. She was the last relative of my parents' generation, both having crossed over many years ago themselves. I'd been feeling rather blue to say the least, but I returned to my daily routine within a matter of days. 
On Friday, January 29th, I was driving home after a long week. I was on a very wide and busy street. I stopped at a stoplight at a major intersection. While I sat in traffic, I experienced the most delicious aroma of a cheeseburger. I could smell the patty on the griddle, the yellow-orange cheese, the hot, salty yellow peppers, the yummy pickles and the bun on the griddle, as well as the crispy french fries. The aroma was so great, I said out loud, boy, if the burger wouldn't be cold by the time I got home, I would stop and buy one. And that is when it hit me. There was not a single burger joint anywhere in this area. So I smiled and chalked it up to a visit from my aunt. But my visit wasn't over. I got home and started to relax into the evening. I went into my bedroom and my cat followed as he usually does. When I sat down on the side of my bed, I observed him to jump up in the air as if he was playing with a string of some sort. This went on for about two minutes. I just sat there amazed, wondering what Kitty found so delightful. Then it hit me. My aunt liked cats, but my mother loved cats. So again, I smiled and chalked it up to my aunt, had also brought my mother, which was her sister, both of which loved cheeseburgers and pastrami, and my mother decided to play with my cat. That night, I slept well and happy, and I think that kitty slept well too. It is nice to know the spirits are always with us, even when they take form in the mundane. Comment, like, and subscribe if you're new.